Hey, folks. We're live. Welcome. Yeah. The first dedicated Titan live stream. We've got our own thing now. We don't need our inside Unreal thing anymore. We've started our own and it's definitely not the same people in the background making sure it doesn't all work and uh, keep going. So uh, today we're going to be doing a, a bunch of stuff in this live stream. We're going to be doing a full review of the world. Uh, we're going to be doing an asset review, a uh, design review. We're going to be talking about some of the new stuff that we've added into the project, um, talking about where we're going to be taking the project and kind of like carrying on with uh, design going forward. Uh, and yeah, hopefully have a good time. Before we get too far in, I want to give out some swag. Uh, so we are doing swag giveaways uh, every time we do a live stream. Uh, obviously, the number of people we're going to be giving swag to is probably going to go up uh, every time uh, we we do it because we'll be seeing more and more cool stuff uh, being added to the project. Uh, but for the first round, we're going to be giving away some swag to our moderators who join the Discord. They've been doing an absolutely phenomenal job uh, of, of keeping that near 2,000 people uh, Discord uh, on track and maintained. The, the difference in quality that it uh, that it went from when it first started to how it looks now is just absolutely incredible. So um, big thanks to all of our moderators. We've got Pi, Gara, uh, Klukul, and Al K. Sorry if I butchered the pronunciation of any of those uh, usernames on there, but we will be making sure that you get uh, a good swag drop of, of goodies um, for all of the hard work that you've done so far. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and, and you know, kind of everyone else in the Discord, give some, give some love to our, uh, our moderators because they have really stopped this thing from turning into an absolute train wreck. No, I'm joking, but uh, they've definitely significantly helped with that stuff. So uh, let's have a little look at the world that we've got so far. Um, and we'll have a little fly around and a little bit of a play uh, and see some of the cool stuff that's um, been added to this project uh, since it first started just one week ago, um, which is kind of blowing my mind that we've already got all this stuff in. So if we uh, switch over to my screen, uh, we could have a little bit of a play. So uh, we've got our main character uh, in at the kind of like nice placeholder level. And uh, one of the areas that we have is this massive uh, city that's been added to the world, which is uh, seriously cool. Uh, if we zoom out, we can kind of see all of the different areas that they've started to add, uh, which is really nice. They've got a full entryway. I am having just mild panic attacks about the amount of work they're giving themselves to get all of this stuff done. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes and see how this content gets added in, uh, as we go through the entire click top region, um, has had a ton of block out work in general, um, which has been, you know, kind of really cool to see if we kind of, uh, run up to this city, have a little look around, it makes me really glad I put a grapple mechanic into this game so that we can get around really quickly. Um, but we can kind of start to see all of the different stuff kind of coming in here. So all of these different regional elements. Uh, that we get coming into the world. So all of that city, we've got this massive um, skeleton uh, that's kind of been added in here. This is starting to look really cool uh, as we go through. Got some teeth in there, it's looking really nice. And then we start to get these really granular level um, looking elements coming in as well. People are loving that um, that crane assets. <laughs> it's, getting, it's getting a lot of use uh, out of it as well. Um, See how we're looking through. Uh, we've got a very big pyramid thing that's come in here. Uh, I think this is a very good example of building something that is way too big. Um, so this asset, I think, takes up probably half a kilometer by half a kilometer, and then is probably a full kilometer vertically. Um, when you're thinking about building assets like this for the game world, uh, you really need to consider the amount of work that you're giving uh, yourself with this kind of content. Um, you know, if we take a look back at this city and the amount of stuff that they've got in here and the amount of work that they've got to do, right? You know, all of these buildings uh, have to be made. They're going to have to do just a phenomenal amount of stuff 
uh, to get this whole area to work. And then also just thinking about, you know, kind of how how's the player going to get there? What are they going to be able to do when they get there? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just delete that. Sorry. Sorry, whoever this is. Who are you? Kirill2525. You can chat later if you like. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we're going to get rid of that. Uh, so we're starting to see loads of these kind of like small towns set up uh, and going through. One of the things that I'm noticing with a lot of these is that you're putting up these big walls around all of the content. It makes sense in some instances, um, but in others, it's it's kind of starting to block it out. And actually, it's stopping you from thinking about how you can start blending all of these areas together into different regional groups. Um, you know, what we don't want is these very kind of like just blocked out walled um, gardens, something that apparently we're against generally um, here at Epic. Um, but, you know, for this project, we don't want these kind of like very, you know, locked down areas. We want these things to kind of blend and for you to work with all of the people around you in order to do it. So um, while a, a few walls, you know, kind of a good idea and they can kind of help kind of like guide the guide the player. And, and Sam's going to talk about this a bit later from a design perspective, um, from kind of like a, an art perspective, it's going to create these very harsh and, and, and unforgiving lines in the world. And it's going to kind of make it quite jarring when we start to see that stuff go through. So a really great example of this, um, we actually selected this as um, one of our our current uh, splash screen um, because it's coming along so nicely at the moment. Um, but this kind of little kind of uh, forest area here in the marshlands region with, you know, kind of these these really nicely sculpted trees and, and mushrooms coming through. Um, but through down to here, there's another mushroom region um, with these also really nice looking um, cool little houses that have started to pop up. Now, um, you know, one of the things that you um, should kind of start thinking about when you start seeing regional areas that are, are coming through is, you know, if it's this close, how can we start blending those together and, and how can we start, you know, kind of like getting that stuff shared, right? Because if you think about this, you know, logically, uh, if you have these two distinct groups who are this close together, logically, they're going to be sharing a lot of that stuff with one another, right? They're going to be kind of collaborating and, and they're going to be trading and all of that stuff. And the easiest thing to trade is between those, those places. So unless there's kind of like a good reason for why they wouldn't trade uh, or they wouldn't share. Um, really, we want to start to be seeing kind of like how those areas are going to start to blend together. So as groups, you should kind of be discussing how, how can we, you know, kind of bring the areas that we're building together into into a more aesthetic, um, you know, aesthetically pleasing, uh, pleasing region. But otherwise, we're seeing some really cool stuff uh, coming in here. This is, uh, you know, kind of a really lovely area that started to be developed. Um, Again, the mushroom region's really cool. We've got these lovely kind of swampy, uh, just need to slow my move speed down a little bit, these kind of swampy uh, areas coming in. We are seeing as well a lot of ladders um, and it's I'm getting kind of like a, a general kind of like pressure from all of the people doing this project to be like, we want, we want ladders in this game. Um, so yeah, if that's a feature request that you want, um, you need to put that in the feature request channel and then we will uh, we'll have a chat about it and see if it's something that we want to add to the game. Um, but ladders can be a bit of a pain uh, to, to add in. So yeah, do let us know if that's actually something that you want. We've got this amazing uh, kind of forested area that started to become very overgrown with uh, all of this stuff in. Uh, not sure if that's pushed right, but it looks like we've got a bit of a scaling issue, but with this kind of big dead spider in the middle. Um, this is all great. These are giving me slight nightmares, um, but they're, you know, they're okay. So we've got these kind of egg sacks that have been placed through. Um, maybe have a rethink of the of the bodies, uh, body parts that are sticking out of these though, because that's probably not going to be okay for the age rating of game that we're uh, that we're going for. Um, but otherwise, some really nice assets being formed in here. Uh, particularly this, you know, kind of nice kind of twisty gnarled root that's sticking out of the ground. This has got some great form to it uh, as well. Uh, we'll head over to the Arctic region. 
and we can see we've already got these uh, nice placeholders for, um, you know, kind of like the ice drift um, and kind of little icebergs that are kind of coming through. Um, this is a really nice idea to start kind of blocking out this. Um, again, I'm sure Sam will probably have some thoughts on it, uh, but I'll, I'll let him, uh, I'll save him something to talk about uh, for this. We've got a nice kind of little regional city as well. So it's kind of like an Arctic area uh, where they're going through. And there's some small kind of like sub regions as well, which are, are looking really cool. Uh, we've honestly, we've got so much to look at with this. Um, it's just been absolutely phenomenal seeing all of the content being added to this project. It's like genuinely um, getting quite addictive, pulling the latest version. Um, I think every time I've downloaded the latest version of the, the project, about one to 3,000 assets get added um, or actors get added. Uh, and we're seeing, you know, kind of like these small settlements being developed in these small regions. Um, and it's just absolutely incredible uh, to see this. Uh, this is a really great idea. Um, again, I think so Sam's probably got some design <laughs> design thoughts on this. Thoughts, uh, but from, yes. Yeah, but from an aesthetic point of view, it's a, it's a really neat idea having all these kind of like hanging, um, you know, hanging homes uh, in there. One of the things I will say, though, is that when you get to assets this big, uh, similar to kind of the the kind of tree over here, um, but you do really need to start thinking about kind of like the 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 shape of the asset because it's such a large space. Um, you can't really get away with having such hard straight lines. So this big, you know, kind of straight trunk going up, you need to be thinking about what's that going to look like. It's you know kind of at scale. So if we're kind of having a quick, uh, we press play. And have a look at it again always always play uh in game so that you can see the impact of this thing in the, on your character as well so things like these roots right are absolutely huge um so you know kind of how's the uh, character going to interact with them how are they going to kind of move around and then aesthetically you know kind of how are they uh how are they going to look um because we can't really just have a flat texture put on this right they, it needs some surface variation uh, it needs kind of more breakout and stuff like that into the into the world, um, and the same with this. Again, size is a is a massive consideration with these things, uh, so do keep that in mind when you're kind of going through. Um, though they do seem to be getting some lovely sunsets uh, and sunrises in this uh, in this one. Uh, so through, uh, we've got a nice kind of area here, temple area that's being developed, and we've actually started seeing some nice base tiling textures put into here. This is a really great one actually uh, to talk about. We'll, we'll dig into this one a little bit more. I'm just going to increase my pool size. One second, make sure we get the full texture view. So this is a really great idea um, and, and kind of the way that you generally should be working, especially with assets at this scale, you know, relying heavily on tiling textures and trim sheets is a really great way to work. Um, it allows you to really rapidly build up the big blocks of the space um, and it allows you to kind of like then really kind of focus in on the areas that can, can be dedicated to more unique modeling and texture workflows. So this is a really nice demonstration of that. They've really started to kind of just get the really basic shapes in because, you know, you look at all of this stuff, right? And it's super, sim you know, super simply blocked out, uh, super simply, uh, you know, even here, they've not even done like a full uh, model through of these of these areas. They've actually just done a box and then, you know, kind of cap through. Um, but that's fine, right? Because actually, uh, you know, from a from a gameplay standpoint, we can now jump straight into here. We can start to get a better sense of the scale, especially with the the texture work that's being put in. You know, we can start kind of like running around, and you can see like straight away, you know, kind of like, hey, like I I can only just get up here, so maybe give myself a little bit of clearance or a way to think about getting out of here. Um, you know, start thinking about that space a bit more. Um, but yeah, getting these materials in and tiling textures in is going to really help with this stuff. Uh, and don't be afraid, you know, we, we've, we're we all collaborating on this stuff. Once textures have been added, once materials have been added, they are free to use internally uh, for, for Titan. So don't be afraid to start using these uh, in other areas as well. So, you know, this is, this is quite a nice, um, you know, kind of wall material that's being worked on at the moment. Um, there's nothing wrong with going in and maybe kind of adding it into, say, you know, kind of some of the walled city areas over here or even onto, you know, kind of some of the bridge assets over here or some, you know, some of the areas over there. So, you know, don't be afraid to kind of like start sharing and reusing content. 
Uh, and, and that kind of brings me on to a really important point, actually, is that, you know, kind of like where we are sharing all this content, really start to think about how usable the assets that you're building uh, can be kind of reused uh, and how they can be reused in other areas. So when you're building a material, try not to think of it just solely for this is for my thing that I'm making. Think about it in the global context of, you know, kind of how could I make this material useful for lots and lots of different people and lots of lots of different areas. And the really nice thing about that is that once you start doing it, you'll start to see um, that that material pop up all over the place, which is really, really cool um, when, you know, kind of you build an asset and it starts to get, you know, kind of like used prolifically uh, in the in the game space. Uh, so we've got some nice areas over here. Uh, a really great one I want to point out is this uh, this windmill uh, that's been made. Um, it's got some really nice practice on it uh, that I think is worth us having a look at. So first of all, <clears throat> oh sorry, my throat is going today. Um, first of all, from a stylistic standpoint, this silhouette re is is really nice, right? It's got some really good shapes to it. Um, it's not, you know, kind of flat or square or blocky or, you know, there's there's very few uh, actual straight lines to it. They've put in some real curve and some exaggeration into it. This is really important when you're trying to do stylization, right? We're stylizing in both the form and the texture uh, as we go through. So we're not only doing, uh, you know, kind of a stylistic, you know, kind of look, but we're doing it kind of at multiple levels. So this is a really good example. They've not just done, you know, kind of like this straight wall. They've actually put in this lovely kind of like thick curve to it that's gone in. Uh, and then as they work their way up, they've not just done kind of like a standard windmill, but they've really gone and kind of played with that shape a little bit more and exaggerated it out. Um, so this is a really good example of the kind of um, shape stylization uh, that we're looking for. Uh, same with the actual, um, you know, kind of the rock work as well. They've not left it as just this, um, you know, kind of like flat shape and relied on textures. We have nanite, right? We have um, we have the ability to to throw a lot of triangles at these kind of surfaces, and these kind of surfaces are excellent for nanite as well. So if we take a look at um, the the actual triangle view, we can kind of see, you know, kind of what level of triangle uh, detail they've done. And for this one, they've actually. So they've subdivided it in an external package. I'm guessing a little bit here, but I'm probably right. Um, they've subdivided it in an external package and then used a displace to 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 kind of like push those rock shapes out using a height map uh, for their for their asset. This is a really great way of working because you get the full um, you know kind of optimizing power of nanite. You can see that as we pull out, it's really aggressively pulling out those triangles that it knows it doesn't need. Um, so this is a really good way of doing it. And one of the other things to keep in mind with this uh, is that the thing that works really well with lodding uh, are, are removing subdivision levels. So this is something that's really easy for us to do inside the engine. So if you're kind of worried about this, you know, this kind of geometry, um, if it's connected together, if it's contiguous, um, funnily enough, I've got a talk about this coming up on our YouTube channel soon. But if the geometry is contiguous, it, it's very easy for us to reduce that surface down. If if you've ever used ZBrush or Blender or Maya or Max or anything uh, that has, um, you know, kind of decimation or uh, reduction of triangles, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of modifier, you'll see that if you have a good like, contiguous surface, a surface that's connected, it's very good at being able to kind of reduce that down to a very simple uh, asset while still retaining a lot of the silhouette. So this is a really nice way of working. Uh, only thing I will critique on this is that your triangles are a little bit stretched at that level, which means that you've got, uh, you've applied the cylinder, uh, I would guess, uh, and you've not given it enough kind of uh, radial subdivisions to, to avoid getting uh, that. So you, they, they're a little bit pulled out. So you want to kind of pull those in a bit so you get a bit more even. And that way you'll see less uh, stretching uh, and edge damage. I'm going to try and find a better better view for this. So you can see this, uh, this noise that you're getting here. A lot of that is because you've just stretched out those triangles a little bit too much. So if you add another radial subdivision in when you apply that displacement, you'll, you'll get much better result um, for it. Uh, feel free to come in here if you want to, uh, guys, as well on this. Um, but uh, from a, 
the other thing I would say about this, if we're if we're trying to be a bit harsh, uh, harsher on the critique, uh, is that I would say size wise, this probably isn't actually big enough. Uh, the door itself is is um, is quite small, and then the interior space isn't going to lend itself well to doing much. This is one of those things where if this was a a, a real world asset that we were placing in. Um, it would probably be fine. Uh, but where we've got this character and the camera and the distance behind it to kind of take into account, this is um, this is good stuff to try and uh, try and keep in mind. Uh, so then we go through, we can have a look. Collision's not quite set up, so I can't quite see. The, the balcony level doesn't look too bad in terms of height, but again, it seems a little bit narrow. So trying to get a little bit more width in there, really think about how the player is going to kind of move around it and how easily they're going to do that. If you start seeing a lot of like your camera kind of like juddering in, you know, because we've got we've got collision on the camera. So if you start seeing it kind of like move in towards the player a lot and kind of in and out as you're going through, that's a general good indicator that your, your area is not really uh, big enough for this particular thing. So for this kind of asset, um, you know, you can definitely go a little bit bigger, um, but otherwise some really nice form, some really nice shape in there and a really good example of, um, of, uh, of that kind of thing. Another great example found this yesterday uh, while building uh, the regional markers is this Koi temple. Um, it's looking really, really cool already. Uh, and if you look at it, the, the amount of geometry that they've done for this is really minimal, right? You know, these uh, little scale pieces have, have you know, they're just duplicated to, to get them in. They've just kind of positioned them in a really nice way. They've got some lovely forms coming in already. Uh, it reads really well. You can immediately tell what it is right when you go into it. And then when you press play, the scale is quite nice as well. So this looks like it's been designed as like a really open, uh, you know, kind of open temple area. They've got this little kind of water in the middle, uh, which has come through. Um, but yeah, as they kind of go in, you get that really nice sense of scale with it as well. So a really nice demonstration asset for, for blocking out that if you're uh, partaking in the project, it's well worth having a look at this and seeing kind of like how they've gone about blocking out uh, that shape with a real thought about the, the purpose of the, you know, of the area, but also looking at kind of like you can really tell what this thing is going to look like in the future, right? Just looking at the base asset, you can really get a, a good picture of you know, I'm, I've, I've got a pretty good idea of what this thing's going to look like just based on that uh, on that block out. Um, so really nice uh, block out asset there uh, for the project. So yeah, I'm going to leave that now for world exploration because Sam's going to be doing a little bit more of that a little bit later on. Um, I think maybe a good time for us to tackle a few questions. I don't know if we've had any live ones come in yet. Um, otherwise, uh, I can start uh, just going through some of the live stream questions that we had uh, come up. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll tackle a few of those and then move on to having a look at some of the textures and meshes that people have brought in. Um, so question one, can we please make this an annual event? It's too much fun. Um, maybe. <laughs> we'll see how this one goes and, and how much energy uh everyone has at the end of the project <clears throat> i will say it has been insanely fun this has been just a joy um to see what everyone's been creating and to explore this world every single day um i you know like just going on the discord and looking at the community that's kind of been that's sprung up and how friendly and welcoming it is 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 genuinely amazing um We've got a lot of other problems to solve to whether we can do this again. Uh, you know, kind of running this stuff is is quite expensive on the back end. Um, or, you know, kind of at the moment we're projected to spend, I think it's like ten thousand um, dollars for just the Perfor server. So obviously four thousand people and a lot of submits going through and stuff. So it's uh, it's you know it's 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 you know it's it's quite a, quite a good chunk of money uh, for that stuff. And that's just the Perfor server. We've got Cloud DDC coming online, which is a significant cost. Um, obviously, comes with a significant benefit as well, uh, and Horde as well, which is um, actually pretty pretty minor. Uh, on the cost front as well. So um, we definitely want to run this stuff, you know, this kind of thing again. We'll we'll just have to think about how we do it uh, and, and and if we're allowed to, we'll see. <laughs> we snuck it by this time, um, you know, with only, uh, with, the, with the warning uh, from legal, but yeah, we'll, we'll get through. Um, 
Will Epic be doing any sort of quality control on the assets in the world, or is that on each individual biome to filter and ensure everything is up to a certain quality? 100% uh, we are going to be doing this. So we're doing this kind of thing as well. So we're doing uh, critique sessions where we're going to be reviewing the work, giving people feedback uh, on how they can improve and talking through how they can go about doing that. Um, next week, uh, assuming it all goes to plan, we're going to have Folly gone on uh, our character artist who did the initial character Lost Fang uh, for uh, for this project. Uh, who's going to be doing a you know kind of a, a tour of how he how he went through creating that character and how you can go about creating characters that kind of fit within that world. So we are going to be a hundred percent. Uh, making sure that all of the content is is both aesthetically fit for purpose and also is cohesive within the world and is built correctly. Um, we'll also be doing a final pass once the project is over before it gets released as a sample, just to try and make sure that as much of the content as possible is is has been built correctly and appropriately uh, for, for what we're doing. So yes, 100%, uh, we will be doing a ton of quality control because it's going to be the best way for us to teach you how uh, to build assets the, you know, in the right way uh, for Unreal. Uh, will people that contribute only to narrative get added into the credits or be considered part of the project? Um, so this one's a bit of a, an interesting one. It's one we actually didn't think would happen. Uh, one of the really interesting things of this project that spun up is a lore channel uh, inside the Discord that has been very, very active. Um, we we haven't got a lore uh, or, or, um, uh, or written uh, narrative uh, section to the Art Station Challenge. It, it, it was focused on, uh, you know, kind of purely on character art, environment art, VFX, that kind of thing. Um, so in terms of character art, like in terms of narrative, it won't make it into the end project. I think it's probably the ultimate thing. Uh, so unless you are implementing that narrative into the game world um, in, in a model or a VFX or, or a character, then uh, it's, it's not going to be in the final one. We're going to have very limited uh, text. Uh, on the actual release because it needs to be localized and we need to do a ton of stuff with it. So um, yeah, if it's while the law stuff, everyone seems to be having a really great time and, and, and just loving kind of building up the history of the world. And I don't want to stop that in any way, shape or form because this is, this thing's for fun, right? As well. Um, ultimately it's, it's not going to form part of the, the end world unless that, that, you know, is, is, you know, kind of added in there. Um, and I'm going to caveat this quickly. That does not mean that you can put your text into a texture and put that texture into the game world uh, for people to read on a big wall somewhere. We will be deleting that content uh, because it's just not appropriate. Um, but you need to be figuring out how does this law that you're creating uh, impart into the world. And you need to be doing that from, from you know, both the mesh and the textures that you're building in. Um, so there's been a huge amount of kind of talk about the titans of Project Titan, the long dead uh, embedded into the into the landscape. Uh, and I'm going to just go over to this area and be like long dead embedded into the landscape, forming part of the landscape, uh, which this is not, um, you know, kind of like and the kind of the history and the maybe the religions that have formed as part of that. And, and, you know, kind of all of that stuff is is really great to see and is really fun. Um, but unfortunately, the narrative elements aren't going to go in. So if you're not translating that narrative into actual assets and into actual, you know, kind of world building in, in the actual physical world, then it's you, you probably won't be getting a credit for that because you're not contributing to the actual end uh, to the end product. So keep that in mind as you're going through. Uh, and yeah, try and get that stuff in, injected in because um, we won't be including a narrative Bible with the project uh, or anything like that. Uh, will you make an epic cinematic of the best spot uh, at the end of the project? Well, hopefully we won't have a best spot. We'll have best spots. Um, so we uh, are going to be doing a, um, a time lapse of the entire project. So we've got some, we'll have some cameras positioned and we will run through the change lists and record uh, record the world being built up as it goes through. Um, so we will have that. Um, 
we will be doing uh, you know kind of an end fly through as well and a final video um, when we go through in a kind of presentation of the whole project uh, we'll be showcasing all of the work that everyone's done um, and and yeah so so we will be doing uh, a lot of showcasing of all of the awesome stuff that you're doing and, and will do Uh, what are approximately the extents of gameplay features we can expect, if it's possible to estimate this early on, uh, as it would determine the types of content we planned? For example, creating monsters to hunt for a quest makes only limited sense if combat isn't planned at all. Um, so this one's a really good question as well. Uh, the actual gameplay itself is we're, we're going to try and keep as, as limited as possible. Um, just to to make the sample small and manageable. We're not trying to build a full game here. We are trying to build uh, a, an example of how uh, your your world and your your environment should be created. Um, you can go in and you can build a monster uh, if you want to, uh, but we won't necessarily be adding combat to the game. Um, we we generally try to avoid combat with our samples. We we didn't put it in crop out. We didn't put it in stacko bot. Um, uh, so we, we probably will be adding more uh, and we want to hear what you want in in there as well. We're not guaranteeing that we're going to add it, um, but but we definitely want to know the direction that you you know you'd like for it to go into. So we've already had some requests through uh, for features, um, for example, the regional markers um, which we've added in. Um, but there are some things that we just probably aren't going to add. So uh, swimming was a requested feature. Uh, because people want to put some underwater levels in. That's not something that we're probably going to implement. We've already got a range of movement modes already in that kind of serve as a great demonstration of how you can add and create different movement modes with the new mover uh, component that's currently experimental for 5.4. Uh, same with, uh, you know, kind of the wingsuit gliding uh, that's in there at the moment. We've already got a gliding mode in, so we probably won't be adding uh, things like that. Um, but um, you know, keep the feature requests coming in. We look at all of them, uh, and we'll, you know, if we can facilitate it, and it and it provides a unique um, content example for people that you know for that's common in open world games, um, we'll definitely look at adding it, adding it in. Um, I don't know if you guys have any any more you want to add on top of that. Um, I think people should be thinking. Sound of... Mike. My not Mike. Can you hear me? There you go. <laughs> there I am. Hi, folks. Uh, I broke my mic stand this morning. So here I am speaking to you live. Uh, so when thinking about feature requests, think about the things that would enhance what we already have, like play with the gliding, play with all the stuff and go. It'd be really cool if the gliding worked, was tuned slightly differently, or it would be great if the character automatically stepped up over things or that kind of thing versus giant big new features. Think about things to enhance the sort of, we have this palette of movement and movement systems and exploration systems. How could we make them better? How can we really tighten them up before we ship? What are your experiences with them? But yeah, anything that you think might be good, please put a feature request. Can't say we'll do it, but feedback on the existing features is really valuable to us too. Yeah. It, um, yeah, same for, um, NPCs, we've, we've been seeing a lot of requests for um, NPC features and that. Uh, I would definitely uh, like to hear more about um, the types of features that, that you want to be supported on, on NPCs to try and get a better feel uh, for what we can add to that. Um, one thing I can probably uh, say right away is that we're probably not going to use mover for ai controlled npcs in in this project specifically that um uh, definitely grows scope a little bit beyond what we wanted to expect on on this right uh, i've been noticing that um some people have been adding the uh, the titan character uh, as an npc placeholder in the world and that actually caused a few uh, crashes uh, throughout this so we're going to be working on um providing a better npc template uh, over the next couple of weeks uh, so that you can actually add, add it it's more than likely going to be based on character movement component instead of mover and and again i i would like to hear 
more about uh, the type of uh, expectations that you have for things like locomotion um interactions so we can have a better idea of uh, what we can provide uh, in in the given amount of time that we have for this NPCs are incredibly complicated, so yep. scope is key there. And yeah, and especially when you're thinking about them navigating the world. Like if you watched my little level design video yesterday, this is the thing I obsess over. And AI navigating the world is even more complicated than the player because it's trying to make decisions based on often a very low granularity navigation mesh and you want it to look good. You don't want it to animate weirdly or get stuck in corners and there's with the scope that we have, that could be quite challenging. So again, you know, ask for ask for whatever you want to ask for, and we will do our best to accommodate you, but we can't really promise massive feature set for NPCs. Yeah, I mean, AI is a really interesting one as well, right? Because actually um, it's, it's very um, based around the player location at the time. Um, a lot of the things that we, that people are asking about are really persistent um, AI uh, assets that you know so these characters that navigate the world in you know alive the entire time that's a that's a big cost that you're 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 getting there um to try and navigate that especially when from the you know the the main gameplay world that whole thing is streamed in and out right dynamically around the player anyway so you have to be really careful about how you think about streaming in and out players and npcs uh, in in the game world when you're adding that stuff in so it's one of the real key challenges of of building a large open world like this once you get past a certain size and we've done this specifically so we are past that certain size um you start to have to get really careful about how uh your ai are added into the game world and you know if they're streamed in and out and if they are streamed in and out you know they obviously lose all of their data so when they come stream back in where do they get that data from and things like that so um you know you often have to build in quite a complex manager that's able to resync that data um or you know kind of all store that information things like that just um stuff to keep in mind as we're building uh this is why we're building this sample mm -hmm. by the way it's, is to make sure that this stuff gets elevated and that we have good um examples of how you build this like building the uh, map world on the main menu screen is a really good example of that um you know because we don't have a good sample of like how would you go about building a game menu map um for for your game world when virtual textures aren't supported in uh in ui <laughs> and things like that so um yeah it's it's we, we love having these features in and the more you bring them up the more we can discuss them and talk about them more and and, and again try and give you some uh you know kind of help teach you about you know kind of like why some things are more complex than others one of the really great examples that we had of this and you know is is a tower that was added around here so on this island we had about i think it was about 20 stories high so it was taller than the volcano um and we had this really interesting conversation about you know kind of why that tower creates a challenge for uh for the game world that we have because we're working on a streaming grid that's two dimensional um so obviously when you add a layer onto your building um, you're basically doubling up the the space that you've got on top of that. And once you get past a certain amount, it becomes really impractical to stream that entire tower into the game world. Um, so at that point, you really need to start thinking either about a three-dimensional grid, um, which obviously adds another layer of complexity to your, your streaming logic because you're adding another dimension, um, or rolling a custom solution if it, if it's only in that one specific place, right? Which in this instance it was. So uh, for for a single, you know, kind of like large, massive tower that was coming up to about there, I think, um, you would have to implement your own custom streaming logic to basically handle the player navigating up and down that tower system. Because if you moved into the cell where the tower is, it's going to just stream in the entire uh, the entire thing. Um, so this is exactly why we're doing this, right? We 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 are fine with you adding that kind of content. Um, obviously, in moderation, uh, we're fine with you adding that content in because it just gives us the opportunity to go. This is why this kind of thing needs more, you know, needs more thought. You need to think about this kind of stuff. 
Um, so it's it's really good. So we're hoping uh, people are taking this in in a good sense that this is you know this is a learning opportunity for everyone who's joining in the project, and we're able to impart as much information about large world building and 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 game design and game building as possible um, for the duration. So that's that's kind of you know that's the whole reason why we're doing this um, this thing. And please um, don't build custom streaming logic, please. please yeah, please. don't go in and build your own custom streaming please. logic. We'll delete it. <laughs> um so yeah it's you know it's it's a really good example for this stuff so it's we we aren't annoyed in any way when we see that kind of stuff come in because this is like this is perfect this is a, this is an opportunity for me to go in and say this is why this content doesn't work and then you know you can go away and rethink uh re rethink that content uh so um I think that's answered. Duh, duh, duh. Uh, could there be the possibility to work on updates of the Titan map after the initial template launch? Um, so yes, absolutely, because uh, after Titan launches as a sample, it's available as a sample project. Uh, so there is absolutely nothing stopping uh, the original Titan dev team uh, from teaming up and continuing that project on. Um, but obviously, uh, you would have to find your own uh, server host uh, for, for all of that stuff if you wanted to work on it collaboratively uh, like you are at the moment. But the actual project itself gets released for free um, as, a, as a sample game that anyone can download and use for their, for their own Unreal uh, project. So more than welcome to carry it on uh, afterwards. Uh, is there a plan for a mount system? I'm starting to build modular stable assets that can be used, hopefully in all the biomes. Uh, it will be, uh, so it will, it be generic horses or something more creative like bird walkers uh, or wall climbing lizards. That would be cool for in-game traversal. Uh, so great question. Definitely build uh, modular stables. This is actually something that um, I think people need to start thinking about generally. Um, at the moment, everyone's uh, thinking very, very specifically regional to like a single area that they're doing. But actually, one of the great things that you can do, uh, and it started to be built up here a little bit, is start to build these like modular kits that you can use in lots of different other contexts. So, uh, you know, that way you can go in, you can build the asset set, and then you can open up a couple of level instances and build some bandit camp variations and then start scattering those throughout the world. And that's something that you would see, you know, kind of like throughout the game world. Again, um, this is done all the time in, you know, kind of in other, uh, other open world games. Uh, the Breath of the Wild is a great example with that kind of big skull uh, stone head canopy with the kind of like the set bow goblins uh, in there and like the dynamite and then a chest and stuff like that. Um, so that kind of thing is a really great thing to start thinking about how you can place that in the world. Um, so, you know, you can go in and you can build these set pieces that, you know, kind of are, you know, kind of are placeable. And when we can use PCG on top of that, our procedural content tools to actually dynamically make that fit wherever you place it. So, you know, things like snapping stuff down to the landscape, aligning things correctly to the landscape normals or not, um, dynamically filtering out content is really, really easy for us to do. Um, so if you build it, we will, um, you know, we will help make sure that gets implemented correctly so that you can kind of dynamically place those in the world and, and pick and choose how you want to place it. Uh, so a stables is a great, is a great place for that, right? So having these kind of like set areas where people can 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 potentially get mounts. We're not saying we're going to implement mounts um, because again, that's that's a whole other playable character that you're basically having to spin up, right? Um, that has a completely separate move set. Um, if it's a if it's a horse or anything like a horse, and it will be quadrupedal, which is a pain in the butt to uh, to get um, you know kind of like uh, feet placement and and angled on surface correctly without it looking just utterly insane. Uh, so so that kind of thing is is very difficult to do. It's probably where the bipedal mount came from because someone just went, "We're not doing horses," um, and so the the bird mount was born. Um, so so yeah, we probably won't do a mount for this um uh unfortunately um seb's just gone oh thank god um because yeah, because we'd be making him build it um but yeah it's putting the stables in it's still a really good idea right it's still a really useful thing to have in the world and uh is a, is a great great world building uh opportunity 
And even if we don't have writable mounts, that doesn't mean we can't have things in the stables that are running an idle animation. Like if you look at a lot of open world games, yes, there are NPCs moving about, but there's a lot of NPCs that are basically just playing an animation in a static location to sell the space. And so you can treat them like that, even if they're not writable. Same with the other NPCs, right? Like they don't need to move in lots of instances if they're... Um... Often if they you you need to trade with them, you want them in a fixed base anyway, so that they don't wander off and then you don't know where to go and trade your herbs or you know, kind of swords or whatever. Um so da, da, da. next question. What exactly is the reasoning for targeting mobile slash switch with this project? With a sample project, and imagine developers would want to be the targets with adequate equipment. Uh, is this just a proof of viability for lower end hardware or a general necessity for samples to work platform agnostic? An internal technical challenge for the game, for the engine. Pretty curious about that. That's a really great question as well. Um, so uh, our team, we tend to try and build all of our samples to be uh, platform agnostic as a standard um, because we want them to be as, uh, as you know, kind of as, you know, as playable as possible across all platforms. It's also um, pretty common in industry, right? The switch is is a is a bit of a pain in the the backside in some ways because it's such a pop, uh, popular platform um, that a lot of a lot of games have to focus for it. Uh, one of the interesting ones with like if you saw Hogwarts Legacy, which I have no idea how they managed to get that thing running on a switch at the at the quality level and and performance that they did, but it was absolutely astounding um to see but it's it's something that you see a lot in games that you that you have to kind of support if you're going to release your game you're going to release it on the core platforms right so um while mobile is just an equivalent for switch because switch is essentially you know running on l quite low end you know kind of old gen um mobile hardware at this point uh it's it serves as a really great uh, anchor and, and kind of marker for okay if we're going to build a game we're going to have to release it on these platforms um so we want to make sure that we're, we're we're doing an accurate representation of that game's development uh, for that um so a couple of reasons there but that's that's the main one um is that you know we want to give people a good accurate representation uh and and we can do it in unreal right like we have all of the tools available to um to make sure that our textures are uh, appropriately sized per platform, that our meshes are uh, appropriate geometry counts per platform, that our materials are appropriate um, quality levels per platform, and and all of that stuff um, is is you know is within our within our ability. So we want to set that standard, and and again, it's a great teaching opportunity um, for that. Uh, right. Hello. Thank you for organizing the event. I have a small suggestion for the video. Would it be possible that every time a question uh, is being solved in the live event, it would be shown in the video? If possible, it would be uh, easier to follow the live event. Thanks in advance. Um, that one's not up to me, unfortunately. Uh, that would probably be down to, to the, the people hidden away in the background actually uh, managing this stuff for the live stream. Um, but. They know we've asked it now, so it's kind of, it'll be up to them. Um, can we please involve animators and riggers for creature collaboration or animation that are not already made for the character? Uh, so there's there's already a bunch of animators and riggers who have, um, have sneaked their way onto the, the Titan project, which is absolutely fine. Um, so there are already a few in there. More are welcome to join if you want to. We don't have a specific challenge category for it, um, but we do have a lot of artists who have decided to make their own character um, with its own rig. Um, I think probably without understanding the full ramifications of, of what that would entail. Uh, so if you would like to join, you're more than welcome to, to sign up for the ArtStation challenge. Probably just pick the, uh, the character category. Um, we we add new um, challenges every Monday, uh, so you will have to wait until um, that kind of round, that batch of developers has been added in if you are new to the project. Um, but you're more than welcome to join, uh, and and yeah, uh, have fun um, talking to our character artists uh, on that, convincing them that it's not a massive amount of work. 
Uh, is there any protection against viruses, malware, hacker attacks? Uh, right now, anyone can join the jam, have access to the repo and submit anything. That's not true. Um, uh, I looked through the profiles of people from ArtStation who joined recently, and some of them have empty accounts with zero activity. Uh, so the the project is uh, has been has been secured. We're not going to go into details on how uh, on how we've secured it because that's that's just going to give people who may want to uh, try and do it some information. But um, you know, kind of we we are using um, a secure server uh, for this, uh, and we have a a very stringent set of permissions in place. Uh, that um, that prevent people from submitting certain types of content, uh, certain types of assets, um, and and limit to what they can actually access. So, as many of you have probably realised, you can't edit the landscape and submit it um, because it's it's restricted. So we have some restrictions in place. Um, obviously, uh, we like everyone else are not immune to this. So we very mel uh, very well may. Uh, get hacked at some point um, as as any studio or any project or any any website uh, may get. So we can't guarantee it, but we have put some uh, measures in place to try and prevent it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Can we change the watercolor in the sulfur biome? Yes, you can. Um, but you are then responsible for that water material. So keep that in mind. Um, we also have got a set of the water materials in the base content folder as well. So um, if anyone is interested in taking a stab at the water in general for the project, feel free to reach out on the Discord. Um, is there a more in-depth guide to naming convention, folder structure, or can we have a recommendation? We have a, a guide being written by Sam as we speak uh, to give you some more guidance on folder structure and, and naming conventions and things like that. Uh, originally written by one of our mods uh, for it. So uh, yes, we will have that added to the README soon um, to give you a bit more guidance on that. Uh, can we make big Titan boss monsters walking around? No, no, you can't. That would be just so much work. <laughs> um, yeah, the... That's that's going to be quite a problematic thing. Um, obviously, you know we're not making Shadow of the Colossus. Um, that needs a, a massive amount of tech in order to add. A lovely idea, uh, but the brief does say long dead Titans, uh, so they're not alive anymore, and they are very much basically the landscape at this point. Um, so um, if they're visible at all, so yeah, they should be embedded in the ground and definitely not moving <laughs> at all. <laughs> If once we've shipped, if you want to turn it into Shadow of the Colossus, please do. Yeah, Go not well. an exact copy of it, obviously. You you know your own take on Shadow of the Colossus, yes. but uh, uh, but yeah. Do not clone yeah. games. You go for it. Um, her character in showing art station. Uh, where you'll create is set in a pre-industrial era. Yeah, I've seen sci-fi futuristic ideas for characters floating around. Am I misinterpreting uh, uh, the brief? Uh, no, you're not misinterpreting the brief, uh, but other people may be um, if they're submitting characters that are not, um, you know, kind of pre-industrial in in terms of in terms of their design. Um, so uh, this is something that you should point out if you see it, um, and when you know, kind of, they start adding those characters to the to the world, and we start seeing them a bit more, we will be flagging it as well as something that's not appropriate and not aesthetically in keeping. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, though, that some people are using things like the Unreal Mannequin that may look sci-fi and out of flavor, just as placeholders for things that yeah, they're going to. Point. Yep. Yeah, that stuff may not, um, you know, kind of be in there, uh, finally. Um, can we use sounds or ambience music, self-created or royalty-free? Are voice hero NPCs a possibility? Um, generally, we're, we're asking people to stay away from sound. It's not an area that we're doing for the jam. Um, if you did add any music, sound effects, anything like that, it has to be 100% authored by you. You cannot do any content that belongs to another person. Um, we have had to remove a user from the server for adding content that didn't belong to them. Um, the, the Discord is hot on that stuff. They track down the asset in like seconds. So, um, Please don't submit any content that other people have done. Um, again, if you do it, we will just remove you and we will not add you back in. Um, it's a it's a 
you know, just like using AI um, to, to generate your assets or your textures or even your concepts for your project. Um, it's a it's a violation of other artists um, who who haven't signed up to the project and don't want to participate. So don't do it um, because we will just remove you and the content. Um, uh, can we change the shader to become watercolor or painting style? Uh, so we we give you a, a base shader that you should use for the majority of the assets that you build. If you need any features requesting, feel free to add it. Um, a uh, The painterly effect should most likely come from just the diffuse channel um, that you're putting in uh, with some indication on the roughness as well can add some really nice uh, you know, kind of visibility to those to those paint strokes that you're putting in. Um, but yeah, uh, if you uh, if you're confused about the art style in any way, I highly recommend you go back and you read the brief where we list a number of uh, tutorials on the kind of art style that um, is is kind of appropriate for the project. Um, a lot of people could do is having a, a, just a, another double check of that content because um, we're seeing a lot of content that's very realistic, um, very much using just authored substance um you know kind of files that are again very realistic so this is a very much hand-painted uh, aesthetic that we're going for so uh, make sure that you're really keeping that in mind when you're going through compare the assets that you're building to uh to that world um to those references that we've provided oh that's a lot of questions uh sam would are you are you uh, sam's on the um west coast you west coast I, think I am on the west coast yes. so so it's very early for him so i'm just going to check and see if he's awake enough yet to do some design critique and then i yeah. can stop talking for a little bit uh and he can uh he can yeah let's do a design minute let's uh i just want to talk i can talk about a couple things let me share my screen go So I should be now visible to you folks. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about design. If my mic gets weird and quiet, someone can yell at me and I will speak louder. Um, so there are a couple things we need to talk about with level design. Obviously, this is an art forward project. We're not really too worried about mechanics, but the mechanics we do have, we need to really factor in when we're building stuff. So. When I'm going through things here, I am using examples. I don't want to call anyone out or anyone to feel called out. It's just some examples I found in the map of things to think about as we do design. So the first thing I'm looking at is this awesome, like dragon worm skeleton thing. And what I really want to do with it is, honestly, I want to jump through the eye and go inside and find something cool. But if we look at player collision, Right now, can't do that. It's just a giant blob that is taking up space just the same way that the ones over here, you can't actually run through them. You have to run around them if you explore this area. I've been doing sort of travelogue over the last two days, just wandering around the map, looking at stuff. And this is it's a fantastic model. But you know, as we start to move further along over this period of the art jam, you really need to factor in your collision. There are some really good guides to building collision, either in the modeling tool of your choice or even in the editor. I posted a little video about it yesterday and some documentation in the uh, README channel. Go to the README channel, it's full of useful stuff. So this that's a very basic thing to think about is if I am the player and I am running up here, I'm immediately gonna wanna go in that eye. So you wanna make sure that when you build out your collision, you're giving the player basically the experience I expected. And that will sort of lead into my next point, which is, again, this is a fantastic space, but, wow, I'm gonna slow down my camera a lot. Uh, if you play from, say, here, let's play from here and see what happens. There I am, I'm in here, I'm in this, this house. Please excuse my performance. But maneuvering in this house, there we go can be quite difficult because it is a very small space. Getting in and out of the doors is very fiddly. Can't really walk along these very well because they're very tight. And also like what you wanna do really is, let's see, let's go out the other side here. You wanna, get, you wanna be able to grapple from place to place, right? But if I grab, try and grapple somewhere, half the time I make it, half the time I am blocked 
And then this time I didn't fall, but usually what happens? I hit one of these and then I do this, Ooh. which kind of takes some of the fun out of this village up in the sky. So as we build out our spaces, it's really important to think, how does the player move through the space? How do they engage with movement mechanics? Like it should be really fun to explore this place. It looks so cool. So just putting some thought into the scale, like I am not an artist, don't take this as art critique, but I would make the doors much wider. I would make the balconies wider and also lower, have lower railings on them or collision that guides me over the railings when I grapple towards them for the simple reason that not getting into the next room is really annoying. Whereas if you get into the next room, you feel cool. You're like you're grappling all over the space. So from there, let's jump to my next point, which is, so player expectation is sort of a recurring theme with me. Uh, you might say that is a personal hobby horse of mine, but if you saw my video yesterday, this is one of my favorite clips is me in the very cool starter Island area. This is again, really, really cool space. Um, so while well, the world is loading in, but so come on, load in, there we go. So what I want to do here is jump up, but I can't quite make it right. It's not but it's not so tall that I think, oh, I need to grapple up there because it's just above my height. So it becomes a thing where neither of the movement mechanics is entirely satisfying. You can't jump high and up high enough, but you also, it feels weird to grapple there. So when you're thinking about sort of spaces where you're jumping or exploring in general, think how high do I have to jump? Is this the jump height? If not, should I put something that's half height? between here and there that I can jump up or put a ramp in or stairs or anything like that. And if the, that's really important is when a player moves through a space, you want them to be engaged with the space, not annoyed at it, because as you get annoyed at a space, you get taken out of the game and you become, you're like, I'm a player playing a game interfacing with something's getting, and I'm having my suture with the game world to use a slightly pretentious term broken because I'm now irritated at it. Whereas if I'm in a state of flow or I'm jumping, running, grappling, and it all makes sense because the world is laid out with those in mind, then I'm fully immersed. And that leads to sort of my next point, which is, again, these are all, these are all really cool spaces. I just want to demonstrate a point just because I'm going to like really hammer that point as hard as I can. <laughs> and each time you're going to watch me wait for my frame rate to catch up and then start moving. So you see these cool, like plinthy areas here. I run up to them. That's my experience. I stop. What I want to do is I don't want to jump up because that's just, it's like not quite high enough to again, be fun to jump up. Like jumping up here feels right. Jumping off here to here feels right. But jumping up these feels wrong because they're steps. So in a situation like this, what I always recommend is have your collision actually be a ramp, not stairs. Because if you look at the way we often do things in games, like we, what we'll do is we'll build stairs that look like stairs to the player. They look like this, but in reality, their simple collision, which is your collision that is on the base level, what your player collides with is just a ramp going from, so you would have a ramp from say this point from one of these edges down to about here that would guide the player up. And then your complex collision would actually resemble the shape. So the IK on the character's feet properly match to the space, but your actual navigation collision is a ramp. So think of that when you're laying out your space, your collision doesn't need to be, especially a simple collision does not need to be one-to-one -one with the geometry you built. It just needs to, it needs to guide the player and be representative. So no one's like hovering in space and so on. So I think I have, yeah, I have one more point to make which is, okay, I said this yesterday, I'm gonna say it again, and this is not to target anyone, but like we have two broken bridges, basically completely parallel to each other in one space. If every bridge is broken, then no bridge is interesting. If some are broken, some aren't, then it is much more interesting space because you are surprised and delighted because you're like, I'm running across a bridge. There's a big hole in the bridge. That's exciting if there's a hole in the bridge every time. It's not exciting. So I think people making bridges should start collaborating and working out who does what where, just so we don't end up with a whole bunch of the same kind of experience throughout the game. We're like, oh, it's a bridge, it'll be broken. There's a million ways to make a traversing a space interesting. 
So we should lean into that. Um, and this particular one I picked because what I would want from this space is one, it's right now, obviously it's a block out. I'm not going to go too hard on that. But what I would want is this is basically maybe do two or three of these gaps at most, not, you know, six plus the start, and then maybe just one and have it be, say, the maximum length of a grapple. Have it be a thing that shows you as you leave the starter island, this is how far you can grapple. Have one of them be lower down, so you have to glide down to it. Have one of them be higher up, so you have to grapple up to it. But basically, if you're going to create an experience that leverages our traversal systems, make sure that you're really leaning into them, not just going, oh yeah, they'll grapple around or whatever, but yes, this is the appropriate distance to grapple. This is the appropriate distance to jump or run or glide or so on and really play through your space. You'll notice I keep going into the editor, hitting play and running through the space. Do that a lot because otherwise you'll find that you are basically building a world from this perspective where you're looking, actually looking down at terrain <laughs> that is many, many kilometers. And I mean, this affected me when I was building out the desert. I built out this desert and then I was running through it. And I'm like, wait, this is huge. I have built it out totally the wrong scale, so I had to go and redo a lot of my work because I was like thinking up here, when really I should be all the way down here. And just for those who don't know, if you hold the right mouse button and you scroll wheel, you can control how fast your camera moves. So that would be my uh, game design minute for <laughs> this week. But yeah, really think about the player experience because ultimately most people who look at this thing will be playing it, running through the world, as opposed to just looking at it from a God's eye view. So you want them to have the best possible experience. And as a game designer, that is kind of my watchword. I think that's me. Awesome. Um, cool. So I want to run through, I realize we've still got a ton of questions to go through, but uh, we should probably just do a little bit on some of the assets that have been added to the world. So I'll do just a a little bit looking into that and then we'll we'll tackle a few more questions uh, as they come through uh so these are some of the assets that have already been added to the world uh, i'm just going to filter by textures for now so that we can start looking at them uh, and you can see we've got a lot <laughs> we've got quite a lot that's already valid this is just for arctic so let's expand it to the full environment uh so and this is only for the people who've actually formatted them correctly so that they'll get seen uh, there could be many more um but there's a lot of stuff that we can learn about uh about the way that we build assets the way that we build textures um so that we can start building them a bit more efficiently uh and getting ideally uh, a better end product and an end look um for how we uh, for how they look uh one of the things that I see that's really common is um, using uh, high repetition uh, on a surface without variation. Uh, so a really good example of this uh, is, let's take a look through, uh, we can go in. I know I had an example of this somewhere in here. There's already too many textures in here. Uh, so this is probably a good example. So, so this one uh, is is pretty good. Uh, this one's actually probably, uh, you know, kind of not too bad on it. Um, let's see if we can find a slightly better one. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this this is a really good example, right? So, um, for this texture, we have this, you know, this this tiling texture that's been made, but we have just a massive amount of repetition uh, on that texture. At the moment, it's two K by two K. Um, but if we actually, you know, kind of look at the variation that we've got on it, this could be represented with a much smaller texture size. Um, so we could say take, you know, like from here to like here, maybe, you know, just get like a bit of a square. Can I print screen on this? Is that, you see that? No, you probably can't. Um, so we can basically shrink this texture down to a much smaller size uh, and get the exact same uh, texture resolution from it. Now uh, we can then have the bit of a problem, right? Where if we, you know, if we if we've done it uh, in this way and we don't get the variation, then we lose some of that variation across the surface. Now the reason why I say these aren't too bad is because they have actually put variation across the entire texture, so they are justifying the the use case in in that way. What I will say though is that a lot of these are uh, could be represented in pixel 
uh, in pixel form. So uh, for each of these, this could essentially equate to a pixel square, and you could then use that as a mask to create variation. You need to uh, add uh, some extension to some of the materials that we already have in the project, but it could be a great way of doing it. Um, so like I said, these ones aren't too bad, but it's something that I see a lot um, with this where people will make, uh, you know, some tiling texture and it's really, really grainy and they, they kind of go through, they lose a ton of resolution. They have to end up upping the texture size in order to get a, a better, um, in order to get the resolution back. And actually they'd be much better off just thinking about that texture from the two different states, right? So from the micro state, which is the, you know, kind of like the texture, um, you know, kind of the small texture detail, which they can just tile more to get. And then the, the larger state, um, where they kind of go in and they, you know, they they create the variation across the surface. Now, if you use those two things and blend them together, you'll get a much better end result, um, and you'll get you'll use a significantly smaller texture footprint um, when you go about doing that. Uh, mostly, uh, I've actually been seeing some reasonably good UV packing practice on here. Uh, there's some stuff that's uh, that's not great, uh, but there's a lot of decent stuff in here. Uh, one of the things I am seeing is uh, is stuff like this, where they've just got uh, an alpha and a mask without any variation in the R, G, and B channels. Um, this is a real missed opportunity for you to put data in here. So when you import this texture in, it's 1024 by 1024, you're only using a single channel um, for that mask data. Uh, and so, so basically all of this extra texture data, you're just wasting, you're just throwing all of that away. And that's a, that's a significant amount of memory um, for something that you just need a single channel for. Uh, so really one, you should be channel packing this in and utilizing it in other areas. If you don't need a, a, a color channel for your asset, that's absolutely fine. The actual shader that we've built, um, the example shader, uh, inside our environment, global materials and uh, MI base material it has an option to disable the albedo texture and just use a tint parameter. Uh, so that's absolutely fine. If you just want a single color, then just use that instead. But don't waste uh, your RGB channels um, with, uh, you know, kind of with just using a single channel. Make sure that you're doing it in. Uh, the other thing I would say about this is that the actual texture itself is is way too high detail. You want to go much chunkier, much more volumetric. Again, take a look at some of the um, tutorial references that we put through for uh, for foliage creation and, and creating kind of like nice chunky volumetric uh, foliage. And then also the alpha channel is the absolute worst place that you could put a mask like this, where it's just a, a, a binary mask, right? Black or white. Um, that's because the alpha channel is the is basically the most expensive channel that you can have out of all four um, because of the way that it compresses that data. That's why if you use the alpha channel, you should only ever use really uh, data that needs high precision. So that's height maps. I think that's basically the only valid use case for it, to be honest, is, is for height data um, or anything where you want something that's going to be less compressed um, and is going to give you a better texture representation. So that's why we say um, when you're bringing in your textures, you should use the RGB channels for roughness, metal and uh, ambient occlusion. And those three can be swapped out for other things if you'd rather use them for different things like masks, subsurface variation or emissive uh, variation. Um, we've built all of that stuff in so you can use those three channels for whatever you want. But the height channel for that for that uh, masks texture should always contain either height data or you should compress without um, without alpha on those textures. That's just a, a tick box uh, on this one here. So make sure uh, you're not wasting uh, texture space unnecessarily because that's going to add up quickly uh, and you're still going to be loading in those textures. If you use any of the channels, you're paying for all of them right when you when you load them in. So uh, just keep that in mind um, when you're building. Uh, let's take another look through uh, another thing I'm seeing here as well. Uh, so this is, you know, so it's a good example of, a, of an asset that that could be, you know, really, really easily improved with a few simple with a few simple tricks. So uh, the first one is that the actual 
wood material that you're using is is reasonable but you actually have some cross grain information on here so you can see this is your kind of like paint direction is vertical on this slat here but when you zoom in you can see a secondary channel that's actually going in the complete opposite direction um, so this is something you should really keep an eye on uh, as you're building. Uh, you can also see, like I'm assuming we've got the UV pack here for the square, which is basically the plank that you've got. Um, and, and you've got this green edge along all of it. Now, I'm not sure if you've uh, split this um, it by each individual uh, by each individual UV um, and you've, that's just kind of the edge but ideally you should be making sure that the uh, unused areas of your UV match the colour of the rest of the UV <laughs> so when we mip map which if you haven't come across mip mapping yet, uh, it's basically just your texture gets smaller as you get further away from it because it doesn't need that texture resolution. Uh, it's a simplification of that, but um, we'll, we'll use that for now. So what that means is that when you import your texture in, you actually get quite a lot of variations at different sizes. And that's why we also use Parrot 2. Um, when you use your background color is different, it will start blending those colors together. So if you've got like a harsh black or white or um, or you've got anything that's not sympathetic to the actual UV textures, you'll start to see bleed of those textures come through where it uses the different lip channel. Um, so when you do that, just keep in mind that you need to make sure that those textures are matching uh, on that content. Uh, this is a diffuse as well, so make sure you're compressing without alpha and you're not using an alpha channel um, for, for that wasted UV. Uh, also, try and keep your directionality uniform when you're going through. So you've got these uh, planks here uh, at the moment, um, but you also have some planks at the top and you haven't actually adjusted your UV direction for those planks. So it's going through. So rotate uh, those assets round. Um, again, uh, for these kinds of things where you have it, you might even be better off just splitting out the whole material property from another. So you could have your wood texture um, and again, like you can, you, you know, custom UV these, but make sure that you're getting value from that. Um, so if I were to compare this, uh, you know, kind of asset to a just a, a simple tiling texture wood, I wouldn't see any unique uh, variation on that at all. Uh, it would basically be kind of pointless, right? Um, so if you're going to uniquely UV an asset, make sure that it's actually benefiting from that unique uv uh, when you're when you're going through and building it um, in general using tiling textures trim sheet textures is a great way of building out the surface and building out the assets it's really really useful they're very reusable across surfaces and we've started to see a couple of them uh, coming in here um, so with this example one as an asset um, the textures are clearly not done yet um, but you can use them to represent a really large volume of the surface. So with this particular scene here, they're breaking it up in a really nice way. So uh, if we look at this asset here, uh, let's just go out of our browser. They've split it into a small number, focus on small, uh, small number of uh, material IDs. And they've got one, which is kind of like this uh, tiling uh, floor. They've got another, which is a tiling brick wall. And then they've got one more, which is a trim sheet texture. Um, now you can see that they haven't utilized this full texture sheet yet. That's absolutely fine because actually it just leaves space for more trims. So uh, my guess is that if this isn't being used as just kind of like a blank space um, to texture, my guess is that they will continue to populate this with more trims that are usable in other areas. This is really nice because we are tiling in a single direction. So that's basically the kind of definition of a trim. Um, so basically we can trim along this axis, but it doesn't trim uh, vertically. It doesn't tile vertically. Uh, and it's a really nice way of working. So you can actually get the, the bulk of the surface out uh, when you're doing it. One thing I will say, so a few ways that we can maybe go about improving this is by avoiding uh, our flat surfaces on this. So we have this, you know, kind of reasonably nice uh, texture that's been made. Uh, like I said, definitely still needs a little bit more work. Um, it's it's a bit harsh on the edges here. It's very clearly using some very simplistic faceting. Uh, could do with a bit more character. Uh, but as a base, it's really good. Um, but one thing that we can start doing is we can actually start using that to displace the surface. So like the, um, the uh, windmill that we looked at earlier, 
And this is really easy to do. There's a few different ways that you can do it. So uh, the first uh, is actually kind of built into the engine now. And it's using tessellation. So this is a new feature for 5.4. It is uh, a usable uh, on our base materials that we've provided. So I am sorry to the person who built this, but I'm just going to do a little bit of uh, messing uh, with your asset. So if we go down to enable tessellation here, also turn off masked because uh, we uh, this isn't a masked material. Uh, enable tessellation, and I'm going to go in and set the magnitude to something like 90. Uh, if we enable this on our asset, so we go in, let's save it. Uh, and we probably need to enable Nanite on the actual actor as well. Wait for it to save. And we'll go over a few different other ways that you can set this up as well, uh, because Nanite tessellation is quite expensive. So uh, we only really want to use it in certain instances. Um, Right, so if we go to our asset, we can't see anything at the moment. I'm going to go in and just enable Nanite, hit apply. And now we can see that we already, because this person, again, they listened <laughs> when we said, please make sure you put your height map in the alpha channel uh, for this. Uh, the texture is automatically going to pick up on that and it's going to use it. Um, so we get this really nice kind of like blocky variation. Now you can see that we get some tearing if we go really in close to the edges. And that's because the way that you've built this texture, you haven't given yourself enough texture space on those edges for it to have some good, uh, some good information for it to use. So it's worth trying to chunk out uh, any areas where you have really high uh, surface variation change. You should give yourself some visibility on that. And the more you can give it, the better you'll get because you're giving yourself actual texture space to use on that. Um, so this is a really nice way of bulking that out. And you can see the kind of the change that it makes straight away. Uh, now, the other way that you can do this is by actually just doing it ahead of time inside the whichever tool you're using. So go in, subdivide your surface um, until you have good text, uh, texture resolution compared to your uh, geometry resolution uh, and then just go in and apply a displacement to that surface and then import it in as that. The really nice thing about this as I said is that um, this geometry uh, lods down really uh, really easily so you can go in you can do that. Now that is going to be much cheaper than this version which is doing it dynamically um, the benefit of dynamically, though, is that we can actually uh, we can blend it with other stuff. Um, so I've got a uh, here's one I made earlier uh, example uh, that we can take a look at. So if I go in, blend example, delete me. I'm not going to save any of that. Uh, no, I don't want to save it. I'm going to ruin that person's work. I am sorry for just completely messing with your assets, by the way. Um, but that is the whole point of Titan. Uh, so one of the nice things that we can do is we can start blending this with, with other assets uh, and using it to kind of create dynamic variation. So you can see that we've still got that really nice kind of like uh, blocky uh, height displacement. But now we're actually mixing it with kind of like a mortar cover um, or something similar. Now we're going to add these uh, material um, blends in uh, today uh, so that you can start playing around with them. Um, but basically we're using the, the material layers parameter to create some variation. So because uh, we're doing this dynamically, we can change uh, the variation both per asset. Um, so if I were to kind of take this and then kind of just move it down, you can see that we get the kind of like that um, that mortar variation is kind of fixed into the world because of the layer that we're using on that surface. But then we can also change uh, the strength of that as well. And that's going to work dynamically on our asset. Uh, and it's also going to work for kind of like other stuff like fall off and things like that. So we can increase it. Uh, we can do multiple types of blend. We're going to uh, add a few different examples. Uh, please, 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 please keep this to a minimum <laughs> or maximum uh, of three blends. Please don't do any more than that. Every time you add a layer, you are um, you are basically adding the processing on top, right? So this, even though you're only seeing um, that base material, which is very, very basic, right? It's just a, a flat white color on there. We're still processing all of the cost of this shader as well. So when you layer, it's not doing the intelligent thing you might be just assuming it's doing because again, this is a dynamic process. So it doesn't know that it's not going to be needed at some point. So it has to always be evaluated. So please keep this, uh, this restricted. Um, the other benefit as well, and this is again, why we're doing this as a cross-platform project. We'll just wait for texture streaming. 
having a real think about it. I wasn't doing this earlier. There we go. Uh, is that um, when we build this for platforms that don't support Nanite, I'm just going to turn off Nanite, we keep the blend, but we lose the displacement. So we don't pay for the cost of the all of that heavy displacement that we had on the surface, um, but we still get that uh, that lovely blend in there as well. So this, this works across all the platforms that we'd be releasing onto, um, assuming that we don't go too crazy uh, with that material layering uh, on the surface as well. Uh, so a couple of ways that you can start to kind of like um, build up that variation. Again, try and only use this on really large scale assets where that variation is really needed across the surface. Um, there's a few different ways that you can kind of add that variation in, both in vertex color uh, that's pre-baked, again, because Nanite doesn't support per instance vertex color variation, um, but also in world space units or, or vertical alignment uh, UV coordinates. And you can use loads and loads of different things to create different variation on your surface. I added a noise texture into uh, into my blend uh, for this one, uh, so you can kind of see it. Um, we've got where'd I put you over here? Blend asset. We've got a noise scale texture here. So if I just make sure you can kind of see it, you can kind of see the scale that goes up to. Uh, you go there. You might notice as well that if, when you kind of make a change, it doesn't necessarily, you get some weird shadowing. That's just our shadow cache invalidating. So as soon as you move around, that'll update. So don't worry about that uh, as it goes through. Um, but yeah, this is a nice way of starting to add some more detail to your assets. When we go for stylized, that doesn't mean we're just going for low poly, right? There's the the two things aren't the same. One is a you know one is a limitation uh, on on the world, and and because of that limitation, we've got certain styles that have arisen from it and things like that. Um, so while while some limitations you know kind of are stylistic, um, it's not in and of itself. And an art style. Um, so just because we're going for stylization does not mean we're going for low poly and does not mean we're going for low fidelity. Um, it just means that we're we're thinking about it in a different way. Um, a good example of this is inside our main map. So one of the assets that I pointed to earlier uh, was this nice kind of gnarled root. Um, and we'll make our way back over to it in just a second. I really need to think I just have two Unreal projects open at the same time where I've got the map and that, that just sounds like it's going to cause a massive problem. Uh, so uh, if we navigate back over to our forest scene, uh, where have we got over here? Yeah. Uh, so we've got these lovely kind of gnarled assets here. And this is, you know, it's a really good um, example asset. It's got real character to it, um, but it has, uh, it's, it's very clearly quite low poly. Uh, you can kind of see that there's this faceting, which is where we get these hard edges along the surface. Right. And really, we just shouldn't be seeing that on the high end platforms anymore. Um, basically, if it is if it is curved, if it's a curved surface, it should be curved in the geometry. We should see that the entire way through. So if you if you are seeing faceting basically on the edges of the surface where you shouldn't be, you need to go in and apply another subdivision. Uh, I, it's it's really you know, kind of old, uh, it's, it's hard to get out of it, right? It's something that we taught against, um, you know, kind of when back when I was teaching uh, game art, um, you know, you needed to think about your geometry count and things like that, but that's that's quite an old practice now. The, the best thing to do now is to just give it the geometry representation that it needs, uh, and especially for things where it's, it is like large contiguous surfaces where you're just applying subdivisions to. The subdivisions are so easy for us to remove out in engine that, that it's, it's just not, uh, a big problem uh, that we need to deal with. Uh, like I said, you know, for, for an asset, uh, if we go, go in um, and let's just take a look at it. So if we take a look at our wireframe on this, you can see it's 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 a super low representation. So we can really easily get in that uh, get in that detail. Um, but all we need to do to reduce that is just mark a lot for it and specify uh, you know, kind of how many logs we want it to have and the amount of decimation it does. And it's going to do a very effective job of decimating that geometry down while still retaining the silhouette. Uh, so the silhouette's the main thing you need to be considering with this. Um, you know, add geometry that adds to the silhouette. Don't add geometry to stuff that doesn't add to the silhouette unless you have another purpose for it. Um, but that's the kind of the general practice you want to stick to. Um, again, more some more texture critique. Uh, things like this, again, they get very noisy, very granular. That's not what we're going for with the art style. So try to keep things. This has been a little bit overworked, I think, 
Um, so it's it's gone really kind of like very kind of like, you know, kind of grainy and noisy and really high frequency information in. If you look again at the brief and the, um, the art examples, the tutorial examples that we've given, everything is very painterly, which means that things are represented with thick brush strokes and broad brush strokes uh, for the for the type of style that we're going for. Um, this is a very, very, very fine brush that you're going in with there if you're if you're trying to represent it. Um, I'd also say with something like this asset, once you get to this certain size, think about the shape a bit more. Um, again, this is very linear and very blocky. Um, it's it's quite a, you know, for the, for the size, if it was a very small asset, you could get away with it. But for this, it's so big um, that really you want to be seeing some variation on it and, and some more interest in the shape, right? And trying to, to showcase that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, that's that kind of is is the bulk of it um just when you're going through again try and think about those forms and those blocks when you're doing the koi uh, is a great example of of blocking out with uh with artistic intent um that you should be kind of trying to to mimic it's a great example of that um that bloody pyramid's back go away um right so uh that's kind of the the main things i wanted to say about that um hopefully uh, those points are, are useful for you, um, both from a modeling standpoint and from a, from a texturing standpoint. Um, we can probably go through a few more questions uh, if we've got time. Uh, uh, see, we've got some highlighting going on here. Are these the, are these the ones I should be focusing on first? Maybe <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. Uh, question, can we implement gameplay mechanics? Please don't implement gameplay mechanics. <laughs> um, so we're we're trying to, um, you know, where there's so many people uh, joining in the project, um, you know, we love the enthusiasm, uh, but we we need to be really careful about both performance and stability on this stuff. And uh, it's the reason why we're not letting any programmers in to do any C plus plus because it's just the likelihood of um, it creating problems and blocking people from working is really high. Um, the th great thing about the artwork that's going in is it's so contained that if you create a problem, it's very localized, very easy to identify. It's very easy to kind of like isolate. Um, with blueprints, when you add that stuff in, it's very easy for you to create performance issues, um, especially if you, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, if you're very, very experienced, reach out and if you really want to engage then then we can try and find a way to work with you because i, I you know kind of I, I do want people to have fun with this and enjoy it and focus on the stuff they want um but for the most part uh please just leave it to us to build and we because we're trying to put in as much best practice on how you should go about building that as possible um so let us build it and let us create these demonstrations for you to use and learn from. Um, and, and if you do want to, then then we'll, we'll try and accommodate it. But it really, you know, the, the level of experience you need to have on it, it does need to be very high uh, for that as it's not the sole focus. Um, what would be the concerns with ladders? <laughs> it sounds like ladders are a bit of a problematic or do I understand it wrong? It's like doors, right? Like on first blush, you're like, what's the problem with a door? Um, I think one of the one of the people that worked, worked at Epic a while ago was uh, talk, listed like the, all of the different ways you could go about building a door and all the problems with doing it. Um, with ladders, yeah, they can be quite problematic a lot of the time. Um, it's, often it's to do with state change, uh, for one. Sam's illustrating a very good example, um, making sure you have accurate hand and foot placement for where the player needs to go on the ladder. How do you figure that out? Um, you know, you can do it through sockets or you could do it through kind of like tracing and that's quite expensive. Loads and loads of different things to consider. Often people will just ignore it, which is why you see people in games just climbing, like playing a climbing animation and the thing just does not line up with what they're touching. Um, so that from a visual aspect, it's quite complicated to set up. From a gameplay standpoint, um, you know, you, you can get quite complex with how you go about doing it. So do you create entry and exit points for the ladders? So you have to enter it from a certain point, either the top or the bottom, and then exit it from the top of the bottom. You have to then implement a custom movement mode so that you can traverse up and down the asset. How do you, how does that interact with the other the movement modes that you can do on the asset itself. Can you jump off midway through? If you jump off, can you get back on it? Um, how do you figure out how you get back on? Uh, Seb, have I missed have I missed anything <laughs> there in terms of complexity for ladders? Um, I think it covers uh, 
most of the main concerns. But yeah, it's um, it's more involved that in uh, that it seems. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, we've already implemented a few different movement modes, um, aiming to be kind of like fun ways of kind of like getting around the game game world. So we've got walk sailing and uh, walk sliding uh, for you to kind of like go in and, and slide down those hills. Um, we've got uh, gliding and we've got grappling. So those are kind of like the core movement mechanics we want to stick to. Um, so yeah, we, we probably won't. We're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of ladders, but honestly, who wants to climb a ladder when you've got a grapple hook, right? Um, yeah, I, I know which way I'd want to go. Yeah, it's a it's one of the things where it's a redundant mechanic. It's a less fun way to do a thing you can already do. Mm. And so beyond the fact that it, from a technological standpoint, it's a paint implement, it's also redundant. It's like the wingsuit versus our current gliding. It's yeah. not that a wingsuit wouldn't be fun, but we already have I gliding. Think, yeah, Why I do think both? Probably the wingsuit's probably the reverse of that. Wingsuit's probably a more fun way of gliding <laughs> than, than, uh, than what we have. All right, uh, Sebastian. Let's get it done. Yeah, yeah, okay. Add it to the list. No, I'm joking. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the ladder's complex one. The other thing that I'd like to say as well is that um, when you do put a ladder in the game world, though, you do create an expectation. Um, if I if I see a ladder in a game world, I expect to be able to go up and down it. And if I can't, I, that's jarring. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind from a design perspective as well. Like with some of the stuff that you can build, you can build an implicit expectation of the player that you're able to do something. And when you can't do that thing, that pulls them out of the experience because they, it's a sudden realization that the the world is not as free and limitless than you first thought. Um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why Breath of the Wild was so successful is because, you know, they 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 set a lot of, you know, they they gave you a lot of scope and a lot of things you were, oh, I wonder if I can do this thing. I wonder if I can climb up there or if I can, um, you know, if what happens if I, um, you know, set this thing on fire those things kind of like, you know, kind of reacted and, and had, um, you know, they had persistence and they had states uh, that they would work with. Um, when you jut up against those things where it doesn't let you do that thing, um, that's not a good design feel um, for, that, uh, for that stuff. Um, just wanted to add something to that. Um, I think that there's a very good uh, traversal design challenge in trying to figure out um, how to do something like a good vertical traversal with the grapple hook um, without having to rely on things like ladders or something too obvious, right? So maybe that is something that uh, you can start experimenting with on level design and asset design. Um, I don't know, maybe binds um, suspending something like a box that you can grapple to and then jump off to and then you have something um when you turn 180 degrees that you can grapple onto and then you can start building challenges on the uh, on those to maybe reach some hmm. otherwise out of reach places yeah. yeah it's definitely more fun than climbing a ladder i think yeah. uh question do other people and dev groups have the right to delete meshes of solo devs or is it only the people from unreal who can some people are trolling teams and solo devs deleting meshes. Uh, if people are deleting your meshes uh, and they're not me, because I am deleting meshes uh, that aren't appropriate, um, then uh, you can reach out on our uh, on the Discord and just flag that as uh, if someone is deleting your content and they're doing it maliciously, um, then we will put a stop to that. Um, they should respect the, the work that, that everyone else is doing uh, and make sure that they're communicating the changes that they're making to other people's assets. Um, if we want it, like if we if we did make it so that you couldn't delete other people's or access other people's content, um, it would be a very limiting and not enjoyable experience. Um, it's one thing for us to set permissions for us so that so we do have access to some stuff that other people don't. It would be quite another to set up per user permissions um for four thousand um applicants uh so uh you, you do have full access this is a, a a true game development environment where you are um trusted with the assets that you know could have been created in the scene um but trust me if i uh went into the fortnite map and started deleting content without telling everyone i would be very quickly picked up on that and would most likely be out of a job immediately so um you know, we are treating this like a, you know, trying to give you a, a proper dev experience if that's not something you've had before. We want to try and give you a bit of a taste of that. So um, 
yeah, you, you have access to, to all of that stuff. You are able to make changes to anything that's not checked out in the game world that you have the permissions to do so. Uh, and that does involve other people's content. Um, but you should be respectful of that content. And if you are repeatedly not respectful of that content, we will just remove you from the project. Um, yeah. And if something of yours is deleted, we can always get it back. But yeah, if... we've got yeah we've got revision control for a reason, right? So so um, don't worry about it too much. But yeah, that is the kind of stuff you should be flagging on the Discord with us, um, as anyone who's who's doing that is not engaging with the community um, and doing that. So just let us know. Uh, please add Mac support. We're working on it. Sorry. Yeah, we want Mac support, um, and we need to add that in. Um, we've been a bit delayed with it. We had some uh, Perforce maintenance issues. Turns out adding 800 uh, new people uh, to the server um, required a little bit of extra work than we'd initially anticipated. We're in a good place now. Um, but yes, uh, we, we are working on Mac support for you uh, so that you'll be able to do that. You can always do uh, implement it yourself, but you will need to install, um, I think it's Xcode. Uh, to do it and compile the project uh, in order to run it. Um, but that's something that we just haven't provided at the moment. So everyone else is using um, basically some, some DLLs that we've prepackaged, which allow you to, to use the custom code that we've built without having to compile the project. Um, uh, we haven't done that for Mac um, at, you know, at the moment, but, but we will soon. Can a solo creator host their mesh, which meshes, on the Titan main map or do they have to take permission for it from a biome group or admin of some sort? Uh, so the few points there, you shouldn't be adding standalone assets to the Titan game map. They should generally be inside a container with other assets. Um, generally, you're not going to post just a single asset in the world. You might do, and there are, a, you know, there are a you know, occasions where you will do that. And in that case, it's fine. But uh, for the most part, try and keep them contained inside level instances, which is what we're doing at the moment. Uh, the reason for that is because that they're really easy for us to group process uh, and then also kind of like modify as well. So um, it's a really nice way of working. You can do it inside the Titan main map and, and edit the level inside there. Uh, so you should try and do that. If you're working inside a particular biome, you should be communicating inside the particular biome channel um, for that uh, for that content. Um, that being said, if people are adding content and there's not a lot of action going on in those biomes, um, we will be taking actual content over talking about content. Um, so, if uh, a good example of this at the moment, I think is the is the desert region. I'm about to eat my words because I've just seen this entire city it just gained a giant spring city. Up out of nowhere, <laughs> which literally just must have come in like either today or last night. Um, but you know, kind of up into that point, there hadn't been a lot of space in the desert biome, but there'd been a lot of discussion about it. Um, so, I will say, if someone comes in and, and builds some content in there and it's good content, um, even if they haven't engaged with the group. Going to be likely to take that content over nothing. Um, so I would say um, for the people in your regions at the moment, get your blockouts in now, um, and and we'll be much more inclined to respect that content uh, than than discussions about content. Um, so keep that in. Uh, there are a few people who've picked out a few little spaces that haven't been worked on and have done it. Uh, a good example is this little area over here. Someone's just made like this little area. And that's absolutely fine. Um, I've got no problem with that. If you are working in a specific biome and there's, you know, there's content around you, try and engage with the people in that in that area. Um, and if you're working very much on on assets, if you like, if you want to go in and add a building to this particular uh, asset here, that's absolutely fine as well. But engage with that person, with those people who are working on it. Communicate, collaborate, figure out ways where you can share that content because it just avoids confusion and irritation and, and duplication of labor um so you know if you're going through and kind of like building this stuff just you know just reach out and be polite and um engage with those people um in general people can't say no to you joining a biome we've we, you know we've structured it in a way where the biomes are there anyone can join any biome and, par and participate um so you will be welcomed in any region um, for for the for the help you get. If you aren't, let us know, and we'll um, we'll have a chat uh, with the main uh, with the biomes in question uh, for those. Um, with that point, we are looking for uh, to set up some. Uh, I, I I would need to come up with a better word than regional manager. <laughs> 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 
Biome Overlord, something like that. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking for some people to, to step up as maybe, um, you know, kind of taking a little bit more uh, of a, a, you know, kind of ownership of the of the particular biomes. If that's something you're interested in, uh, we'll we'll make a um, an announcement post, and you can put a, uh, a, a icon for whichever one you'd like to do, um, uh, or discuss it internally on your biome uh, Discord channels on on who would make a good regional lead for um, for that particular uh, for that particular area. Um, it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed it. Doesn't mean that you won't have it replaced by someone else. Uh, if if someone comes along who has more availability or wants to do more stuff, then um, we might you know kind of move those people around. Um, but yeah, if, if you're if you're interested in that, then um, please do uh, let us know when we post that announcement. And uh, did I answer that question? I think I did. Um, yeah, I did. Uh, what if my prop required custom materials? Can I create my own with custom world position offset, for example? I'm trying to do something fancy, and it's impossible to do with pre-made master material. Um, so if if you are trying to do something that's not doable in the currently uh, current example, uh, I would first see if you can add it as a feature request. Um, if it's generic enough, then we can add it uh, so that other people can benefit from it as well. Um, if, if everyone builds their own material for every single asset, it becomes massively problematic uh, down the line, both from an editing standpoint and also from just the managerial standpoint. You end up with just a ton of uh, ton of duplication. So, uh, if you can't, if the master material is not working for you, first reach out and we'll see if we can add it as a feature. Uh, we've already got had that with a with a bunch of things that people have asked for, and we've been able to add it in. Uh, for things like world position offset, um, you're probably okay doing your own. Uh, your own variant, um, but try to use the base material as a as a starter. So the way that we've done the um, the the base pe uh, base material um, is that we've created so that the actual parent is just inside a function. Um, so you can actually extend this out really easily. So if you wanted to introduce, um, you know, kind of some world position offset ad additions or some changes, uh, you can go in and you can set material attributes on this. Uh, I won't save this, but uh, and then you can go in and add whichever parameters you want to override. So uh, you can go in, let's say we can add world position offset to that uh, and, and inject that in. So if it's data that you can inject in after the fact and you don't need to, um, you know, kind of modify anything, go, come, you know, kind of on the end of this, you can also get specific material attributes as well. So if you want to add uh, or combine the pre-existing stuff that's there, so there isn't any world position offset on the current one, um, but if you wanted to add that, you could go in and, and combine that in whatever way you want. So you can create some your own materials that still use the base, so they still use the same standardized setup. And then when you instance off of that, you'll get all of the benefit of the pre-authored uh, parent material without you know kind of having to go in and remake that. Um, and what's really nice about that is if people switch to your material instance because the naming conventions are the same, all of their all of the stuff they've set up already will just transfer over. Um, so it's a really nice way of working. So try and use that base uh, function. The only time that won't work, <coughs> sorry, uh, is if you're trying to do anything uh, coming in to this, uh, this function. So uh, if you wanted to warp the UVs, for example, um, that's not something that you'd be able to do particularly easily because it's all kind of contained. Um, we can look at adding that functionality in, but at, at the moment it's it's a standalone function. So you can override, replace, and add content in here uh, by creating your own material and just copying this function into it um, and then instancing off of it. <clears throat> but please only only do that if if you can't you can't do it and always add the feature request in first because again if we can add this in as a as a universal then everyone benefits from it whereas if you just add it for your specific thing um it it, it has much worse visibility uh on on that so just try and keep that in mind ah voice going uh hello quick question who's in charge of coding the project I can it's this person yeah. here. <laughs> yep. And can I somehow join? Uh, no, not on C++. Uh, we're, we're being very restrictive of that again for mm. the same reason we were asking people not to do too much on Blueprint uh, for stability and scalability. 
Oh, wait, have we got got completely different views? Oh, yeah, okay, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. (laughs) Sam, you point down as well? There we go. Yeah, okay, perfect. No, no, it's it's changed again. Uh, There we we go. Other way, other way, Sam. There you go, that one. That's it. Um, Right. This is professional game development right here, folks. Yeah. Right, Uh, just um, a small follow-up on that. Um, It's not just uh, to keep the project under control. It's also for uh, security. So remember that someone asked about malware and some of these um, some security concerns before. Um, actually, keeping the um, gameplay code and especially C++ code locked down uh, is one of the ways that we can guarantee that someone doesn't sneak in something that uh, could be malicious into the game project, right? So it's much easier to manage and to keep everyone, everyone safe uh, from any malicious code that could be added. Yeah, yeah, you can do some damage with C++. So that's not letting people do it. Uh, can the characters be of other races, like humans, orcs, etc., or just variations of the character you provide us? Um, so that's a really good one. Uh, so you can do your own character variations, but that does come with a lot of additional work. And when I say a lot, I mean a absolute mountain of additional work. So uh, we have provided a base skeleton base set of animations, an example of how you rig, and we're breaking down that character and we've got some more content coming for that uh, to show you how to do it. Like I said, we've also got Folygon um, coming on to to talk about um, how his approach to to designing characters. Um, If you build a character that doesn't fit that rig, you have to build your own rig. You have to skin it. You have to um, you have to animate it. You have to bring it all into the engine so that it can be set up correctly. Uh, if you don't do the entire process for the character and it's not up to the standards that we've set for the characters themselves, uh, it will be deleted. It won't make it into the final project. We, we aren't going to ship any unfinished work uh, for the project. And if you give yourself a mountain of work like building an entire unique character, then um, very likely to not finish it, <laughs> uh, to, be, to be frank about it. So um, for anyone who's new to character art, n- not got a lot of experience, if you've never rigged, skinned and animated a character before or done all of that work, trust me when I say that doing a, a character skin on the one that we've provided uh, is going to be far more beneficial. You'll still learn an absolute ton because you still have to skin it to the uh, provided skeleton that we've given you. Um, you'll get a actual useful output from the end of it that, that, you know, kind of has a much better chance of being included in the end project uh, than if you do a completely unique standalone character. Um, So for anyone doing uh, quadrupeds, bipeds that don't fit the standard skeleton, um, we're not going to stop you because, you know, if that's that's the thing that you want to do for the project, um, we're not going to get in the way of that. But uh, it just to understand it may not make it into the final version of the uh, of the project, especially if it's unfinished um, and it's not built to a good standard. Um, same with bone naming and bone orientation. You have to get all of that stuff right. Um, and that stuff can be really tricky. So, uh, yes, you can. And uh, be careful <laughs> if you do it. Um, one of the things that I think the character artists would really benefit from is if you are going to do uh, some custom rigs standardize those rigs so figure out what your races are going to be and figure out the skeletons that you need for them and then create a standardized skeleton that you can reuse for those characters so if you have a regional area where you've got frog people or um you know or like people that are part shark or whatever um then go in and figure out what that those characters will look like as a standard skeleton design that skeleton bring it in animate it and then build to that skeleton with variations outside of it, just like we've done with our character. If you look at, at you know, kind of any game, um, they are, you know, they're, they're not using a hundred skeletons for their characters, right? With a hundred different sets of animations, they have a limited skeleton count, and they and they are very very carefully and cleverly um, working with those skeletons to get the most variation out of that limited set. So if you are in the character design group. And please, please, please get together, have a discussion about the types of characters you want proportionally and limbly uh, and 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 figure that out and, and give yourselves a unified strategy on how you're going to build those characters. Because every single character artist going away and building their own character and their own skeleton with its own proportions is just not going to work. Um, and we will be removing them. 
Uh, so yeah, don't want to be a downer on this stuff, but you know, we gotta we gotta be clear about how how to build this uh, this stuff because that's why we're doing it. Uh, advice, suggestions on what to do for now uh, for people who can't get onto the project yet, uh, whether because they have to wait for the weekly ad uh, or because they are waiting for Mac DLLs. Uh, download UE 5.4 uh, is a great start uh, to get, get yourself in there um, and take a look at the brief, the tutorials that we have provided, and you can start building some props or some designing some characters that would fit that aesthetic um, you know, kind of before you get started. Um, just because you're not in there yet doesn't mean you can, can't start thinking of content that is going to be useful across the board, um, and that's absolutely fine. Um, if anything, if even if you get into the project and someone's already built the exact thing that you were starting to work on, it's, you know, kind of great warm up. So just treat it as that, as just a warm up exercise uh, when you go in. And like I said, we're adding them weekly. So every Monday we'll onboard uh, all of the new challengers who signed up uh, in, in that time. Uh, is it possible to get a demo build of this world to just fly around and see what people have done? Uh, maybe like a demo build every week or so. Uh, we probably won't do that. Uh, there's there's a lot of work on this. And um, until we have gone through and finalized and actually checked all the content, uh, we don't want to release anything um, that may be, uh, you know, kind of stolen or copyright infringing or anything like that. Um, so it's, it's much better uh, that we... Um, don't release the project until the very end, um, so you have the final sample and it's all been checked through and, and given as much assurance as possible that we've we've not inadvertently published someone else's work. Um, so we're, we're you know very cognizant that that people may do that. Like I said, we've already had to remove a user who's uh, uploaded someone else's work from Sketchfab. Um, so we have zero tolerance on that, and and uh, we will obviously remove the user. Um, but yeah, that's that's uh, uh, we won't be doing builds, unfortunately. Uh, will there be a navigation mesh in the world? Like I said, navigation is a massive consideration uh, for 8K. You generally can't build a nav mesh for a world this big because the amount of data is absolutely massive. Um, you, you generally have to go for a dynamic navigation system, either generated around the player, key, uh, key points. Um, you, if you play any games where you can kind of like pull, try and pull the NPCs out of where they normally would be, um, you'll either see that they either just flat out refuse to go past a certain point, they'll just run back um, to where they started, and that's because they're getting to the edge of where they can safely navigate to, um, or they fall back to a very, very low precision navigation, um, you know, kind of system in place. So they'll stick to kind of like predefined roads, paths, and things like that uh, to navigate. So um, when we, if, you know, if we do add navigation, we'll be doing that right at the end, um, where we know the places where we want to have navigation, and, uh, and and on board that stuff. But during the actual jam itself, um, we probably won't be doing that um, unless Seb, Seb wants a ton of work to do. Seb, you want to do a ton of work? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely don't. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, how are we getting on? We, we are probably at time. But I'll try and finish. The, we've got four, five more key questions that we'll go through. Um, uh, is the movement already in the game likely to stay? Um uh, so we, I think it's mostly fixed. We'll probably be doing some adjustments to the walk, uh, so that you get a bit more kind of, you know, kind of, I want I want a bit more launch when you go off the edge or something. Um, and yeah, so we'll probably play around with that a little bit more. We've been very, very, um, uh, you know, kind of generous with the grapple hook distance, just so that people, when they're playing around can kind of get around a bit more quickly. Um, but, um, we'll probably dial that back in a little bit more than what we've currently got it to. Um, but yeah, that's that one's kind of up to Sam. That way, yeah. I think uh, most of the standard movement, meaning running, jumping, all of that stuff is likely to stay pretty much as is. Yeah, it'll be like the things like grapple and we might tune glide or we might and the walk and things like that are more likely to get tuning. But yeah, in terms of movement speed, jump height, all of that, that's pretty much fixed unless we discover a, a very important reason to change it. Yeah. So yeah, please do build to the jump height. It makes it really fun if you jump and land on the edge of something. Uh, similar to the law keeper question, will 2D concept artists be able to be credited or is credit reserved only for those working on 3D assets? So 
Um, it's a really good one. Um, first of all, if you're a concept artist, I'd still urge you to contribute either, you know, if you don't want to do 3D modeling, still, you know, you could do 2D, uh, you could do 2D artwork for, um, you know, for, for the materials and textures going into the game. So definitely do that. Uh, in terms of concept, if it's used for the actual asset that's been made, so if it has a very clear path um, in, in that regard, then yes, um, you, you, you know, you will still be credited. Um, our credit system is going to be very loose, you know, kind of in, in all honesty, like we, you know, we, um, we will be, you know, kind of both first asking people if they want to be credited, first of all, um, and then also, you know, kind of it, if we see any contribution to the Purple server, you'll most likely get a credit on it anyway. Um, there's, there's only so much checking that we can do on this stuff. So we will be, you know, kind of very generous with, uh, with who gets a credit on it. Um, but yeah, uh, you will get credit if you, if you've done concept that's being used and has, has, you know, kind of, uh, been used for, for exact models, just like, um, you know, if someone on art station wanted to do a model of a concept piece, they found, they should credit the 2d artist that did the original concept. Um, we're doing the same here. Um, da -da -da -da. Texture output guide would be great too. I think we have that in the tech art guide. I think, anyway. anyway. Um, uh, have you provided a mover metrics guide for these feedbacks such as, and that jump is 1.5 tall? Um, no, but the character is in game, so I would go up to your thing and jump on it um, for, a, for a good metric on that stuff. Um, once the sample is released as a sample, uh, what are the rules regarding the use of assets and content in the project uh, or the project game? So this is a really good one. We've addressed it um, as many times uh, as possible, and I will continue to do so. So I'm happy that this question comes in um, because it's really important that people understand the, the end use case of this project um, and that they're happy um, to you know, kind of provide assets for it. So as we said in the art station brief uh, on the initial live stream that we did and also uh, inside our, our content docs, um, the project will be released as a fully accessible sample project. That means they're not downloading a, a packaged game, they are downloading the actual engine project. That means that they will have access <clears throat> to every model, texture, material, um, any piece of content that has been added to the project, they will have full access to that. Uh, and under uh, the marketplace um, guidelines for it, um, they will be able to use that content um, both for educational purposes, but also uh, in any of their own Unreal game projects um, as well. So uh, that means that if you build an asset um, and you, you model it and you texture it, um, you may end up seeing that asset um, or the entire game world potentially inside uh, of a released Unreal game. Now, we won't be the people to release that game and we aren't going to, uh, you know, the, the sample is going to be free for anyone to download. So um, Epic doesn't profit from the content that you do, but the sample game that gets released, um, you know, kind of has the potential to have that. Um, we haven't seen it happen much and we do it, um, but every time we release a sample game, uh, we we do see it get published at least once on Android and Steam and stuff like that. So um, it, it does happen. Um, I'm sure that it will happen again, where someone will take this project and they will just release it on on Steam as a as a download as a downloadable game. Um, uh, as the marketplace guidelines state, they they will be able to do that. Um, it's it, you know it's it's again it's better for people to be able to learn and and, and benefit from this. The best way that we thought to kind of do that was to release it in that way so that people could could benefit from it. And uh, we only have one method uh, for releasing that kind of content under under the guidelines, which is under the marketplace guidelines. So um, we'll release the content for free. Um, so it's downloadable. We'll make sure that you are credited in that. Um, but yes, make sure that you are comfortable with that content being released uh, to the public as a as a Really accessible sample game, and then that content could be used um, by people to make uh, their own games um, in. Oh, I think we got through the bulk of the questions. <laughs> um, I don't know how much time have we got on the on the background. We uh, get a message. Do we need to wrap it up, or can we keep going? Um, 
we've got a few more questions in there. Just give the chat, internal chat. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, let's keep going with a couple more um, before we wrap it up. I'd like to try and tackle as many questions as possible about this stuff. Uh, so um, do you have to be signed up for the project to join the Discord? Uh, I can't contribute to being under 18, but would love to check out everyone's work. Um, the Discord is intended for the people who are taking part in the challenge. Um, so um, that is, that is you know, kind of their space. Um, and while we're, um, you know, we don't have a, a way of identifying people who, who've who managed to get into the Discord somehow uh, elsewhere, um, it's, it's, it's generally not, you know, kind of if we, it's generally not, um, something that we want. So um, unfortunately, try and keep out of that Discord it is for the developers who are working on the project. Um, we will be showcasing the work in these weekly live streams so you can see the updates there. Um, and, and yeah, uh, hopefully uh, we'll run it another time when you're uh, when you're over 18 and can join the project. Um, uh, so I just have to make tons of swimming pools to pressure a swimming mechanic into existence. Uh, no, we're, we're not adding swimming. So it doesn't matter how many swimming pools you add. We have we have a way of navigating water, um, which is with the uh, walk um, swim. So uh, the walk sailing. So um, we won't be adding it, regardless of how many swimming pools you add to the uh, to the project. Uh, will it be a game? Are there gameplay mechanics slash ideas? Uh, it's not going to be a full game. It's a sample project, which means that it is uh, a demonstration of how to go about building these kinds of games. Um, but it's not a uh, it's not a full game in and of itself. Um, which again is why we tend to not be bothered about people releasing it because these you know we're not trying to build a good game here or a finished game. So if you do decide to take the project, package it, and release it on Steam. It, it never does well because it's it's not a finished game. Um, so, yeah. Uh, how big is the project? I don't have a lot of disk, uh, disk space. Uh, we are up to about six gig, I think, thereabouts, maybe a bit under. Um, but expect the project to grow in size dramatically uh, as people add more and more content. Like I said, every time we sync, it's about 3,000 assets. I think we're about 30,000 assets in altogether um, that have been added to the the perforce server so far so um make sure if you are downloading the project you're giving yourself room to grow um in yeah <laughs> i think we recommend in the setup guide 100 gig would be ideal just because that way you can handle if our server balloons because you have to think about most of these assets now are block out when as they get more detailed it's just going to get bigger and bigger so yeah give I yourself some room well, there's a big difference between the uh, the engine project and the packaged project, right? So, um, you know, when we've released our previous sample games, like uh, you know, kind of, uh, so some of the bigger ones that that people at Epic worked on, so Valley of the Ancients, Electric Dreams, Matrix Demo, those projects were about 100 gig. But if you actually packaged them, they'd be significantly smaller. Um, and if you optimize them even further and reduce them down, you could get the disc, you know, the size on disk to be really, um, you know, significantly. Uh, smaller but uh, where we're dealing with the raw assets and the, and the base content that's coming in we have to have all of it available so we end up with a much larger um, project size than what the actual package project would be uh for gt game theory fans does your game have law that tom could theorize on i'm i'm sure that whoever that person is could theorize on tons of the stuff that you add to the game world. Um, so as long as you added it to the game world, then I'm sure they will. Um, can you uh, give us some examples of painterly styles coming out in the world? Um, we haven't seen anything just yet that is, I, I would say, a true representation of the finished art style that we're kind of shooting for. We're getting close with some assets, um, but we are also only a weekend, so it's not surprising. Um, I, I, again, I would use the uh, Art Station Brief um, tutorial guides that we gave as examples for um, potential art styles that you should be uh, that you should be shooting for. Um, first person view, um, you kind of get a zoomed in view on the grapple hook, so you probably can use it that way, but we won't be adding a first person view. Um, we may be adding a camera mode. Um, we'll see how we get on and how swamped with work Seb is. Um, sorry, Seb. Uh, this project is quite interesting from a tech standpoint, but is there any kind of art direction? Again, um, we have provided a number of tutorials on the art style that you should be going for. Read the documentation, uh, read the brief. Um, how low poly should we make props? You shouldn't. 
Um, we have nanite. You should make them as detailed as they need to be to be a good representation of the silhouette and the shape. Um, why don't you ask some members to be allocated to working on blending areas so they focus on those asset transitions? Um, because we aren't going to specifically direct people to, to do stuff because it's not their job. We'll critique the work that comes in and try and guide people. But, um, you know, they're, they're doing this on their own steam. And I'm sure uh, that they will self um, self manage on this stuff. Um, so we'll be pointing out problems and, and issues as they come in and and, and trying to track them. But um, we're, we're not going to force or try and direct as much as we can. We want we want people to have ownership over this as much as possible, while still maintaining everyone else's enjoyment of the project and um, keeping the project. Uh, to a good standard and, and to all of that stuff. So we're trying to find a good balance with that stuff and we'll we'll keep assessing as we go. Uh, do houses have to be big as well because of the camera? Yeah. <laughs> if you want the PA to be able to go into them and to be able to get around them in, in a way that's not going to frustrate them, absolutely. Um, you need to, to make sure that they're big enough for that. Uh, and if you're not sure, then Directly message Sam on the Discord and he Please, can Please, yeah, I would love that. <laughs> what I recommend is put it in a map and run in and out of it and move around it and see how it feels, because that's really how you work out how a place feels and maybe add some additional collision to help the camera out. But yeah, things need to be of a slightly larger scale than you'd expect, because the player may look like they're this detailed character. They're really a cylinder for, for all intents and purposes, and so they need to be able to easily get in and out of spaces. The camera is a sphere projecting back from the cylinder and it needs to be able to move through the spaces. So low ceilings mean it's gonna pressure them on the character. Walls mean it's gonna press in on the character. So giving it room to move makes the game better. I should also think about situations where the camera suddenly pops out a door or pops out a window as you're rotating around a room and how to handle that. Um, newbie question. Sometimes in viewport, the landscape is disappearing when you zoom in. All the meshes stay. Can't find an answer. And what is wrong with my viewport? Um, I'm surprised you haven't found an answer on this because we do discuss it in the tech art doc, and it's been answered uh, quite a few times it's in on the, the Ruby channel. On the on both Go the Ruby the channel, Ruby and, channel. And, a, and, a few, <laughs> and a few other areas. Um, but the reason for that is because um, you're viewing the world in an unloaded state. So if we go into our game world and we uh, click it and we unload it, by default, uh, the game world be, will be unloaded. Um, because to load it all in um, is is quite intensive and we don't want to uh, just immediately crash your computer. So when you view the game world, you're actually building, if you click on any of the assets, what's called the HLOD for the asset. Um, and that is basically the approximated representation of that space, um, which is displayed at distance. Now, as you get closer to that space, it disappears. And that's because uh, that's where the actual loaded data needs to be. At the moment, the engine doesn't have dynamic loading and unloading uh, of cells. So you need to manually load in the cell that you want to work on. Now, at the moment, the world's not too bad. So if you've got a reasonably good spec machine, you can load in the entire thing, uh, which is what I'm generally doing at the moment. Um, but as the world gets more densely populated and more filled with content, we're going to be less and less able to do that. So we need to then start manually loading in the areas we want to work in. The good thing about this is that we still get the view of the rest of the world um, as we're working. The downside is that it can be a little bit confusing um, when you're moving around the first time and you see the cells aren't loading in. Uh, so all you need to do is go into your world partition uh, section here, which is in Windows, world partition and world partition editor. If you haven't seen that before. Select the region that you're currently in and load it in. And that's going to load in that particular cell that you're in. You'll be able to see all the content there. Um, but yes, please do try and read um, all of the documentation as thoroughly as possible um, uh, to save our mods from going insane. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, please do. Uh, will you assign a senior artist to each zone to keep the quality control or something? Um, so it's uh, we don't have uh, a bucket of, se of senior artists to call on. We've brought in some wandering critics who are happy to critique any of the work that you uh, that you put in front of them and, and they'll be getting more active as people start posting uh, less and less block out content and more and more art based content. Um, 
So they will be wandering around uh, and we'll have our regional managers uh, will be uh, expected to be of a, of a, of a reasonable um, ability uh, in order to make sure that the stuff that they're deciding are, are, are good decisions uh, to be making. Um, what's a natural way to add to the landscape? or the ground or make the ground even uh so we actually covered this in a video that i posted on the uh epic tips channel uh on uh, on that so please take a look at that uh video where i go over how you can exaggerate and accentuate the landscape you can do that on the ground as well um we have got the landscape locked uh for the sanity of the people working in the rest of the world um, so you can't make edits to the landscape. Um, you can put in some plates and stuff like that uh, as a temporary fix, but ideally you should try and work with the landscape that's there rather than um, just, you know, kind of mashing a big plane uh, onto the surface. Flat surfaces are, are boring um, and you, you generally don't see them that often in the pre-industrial uh, era specifically. Flat stuff is generally something that's only come about quite recently due to, due to the technological advancements that we've seen in the world. Um, for the most part, everything was kind of skewy and interesting and uh, and had uh, interesting shape to it. So uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. Which type of discipline are you lacking the most? Do you suggest zero experience VFX to attempt it? Uh, no, we uh, you can do any discipline you like in any region you like. Uh, you know, and, and try and learn. Um, we will be uh, critiquing any content that we see come in uh, that's not to an artistic standard. Uh, if you have done some stuff and you haven't had any critique yet, that doesn't mean the stuff that you've done is up to the artistic standard yet. Um, but you should just be keep in mind that you should try and iterate on stuff as much as possible. So um, if you need some critique, let us know. Um, we'll start getting more and more heavy on the critique stuff as the project progresses. At the moment, everything is so experimental and based that we don't want to do too much. Um, just yet. So start getting into a rhythm and start building some stuff and we'll start escalating that as we uh, as we go. Characters need to be skinned or can they be only meshes? Uh, if you want it to animate, they do. <laughs> um, so yeah, you do need to skin your characters uh, in general. Um, and there may be some exceptions to that, but for the most part, you, you will need to, to skin your mesh if you want it to animate uh, and, and deform to the, the skeleton that you've got in place. Um, you can do a character that's just a sculpture if you want to and bring it into the game world, but then it will be fixed. Uh, on the smoke VFX, they set physics delta time to reduced rates to dry stylized animation. Is this playback a concern on Switch or other platforms? Uh, it depends where you're setting that physics delta time. Um, if you're reducing it, I would imagine that you're actually improving the performance as long as you're actually reducing it rather than uh, just telling it to to wait, um, in which case it's still evaluating. It's just not um, it's not updating as frequently. Um, I don't know, Seb, if you've got an extra point on that. Uh, well, the overall settings are locked. So yeah, you if want, you yeah, changed you it on the project settings, uh, that change probably didn't uh, make it through to the Perforce server and it's not going to appear to other users. Um, I'm not sure if uh, a reduced rate in this case means a shorter uh, delta time for, uh, for the effect, which would actually increase the, um, the amount of processing power that you need to physics. Uh, we would have to test. Um, you you can always reach out over Discord and we can discuss this. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty much anything that increases uh, the amount of processing power, uh, CPU processing power uh, that you need to run the project is going to be a performance concern for uh, less powerful platforms. So we need to be careful there. I would say as well, from an aesthetics point of view, having a single part of particle effect that's running on a fixed time step um, where the rest of the game world and the rest of the effects aren't is going to look very weird. Um, so if, if, if we are going to move to a fixed time step, there needs to be some consistency there. Um, so, um, you know, you, you can't just kind of like randomly have it on some assets and then not have it on loads. Um, it should be a consistent thing. So generally, if you do kind of like a fixed time step thing, you're performing that on the character um you know and the characters in the world and then not the game world and the camera is still smooth 
and things like that to avoid you getting kind of like a jittery camera. Um, but if you are going to do kind of like a, you know, do it on twos or something like that um, for an animation style, that, that really needs to be a broader discussion um, because you're kind of creating a, um, you know, a, a real aesthetic decision there, which I'm not against, um, but, you know, you need to come to a consensus on how that's going to play out across the entire world, not just for your particular effect. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the best way to show off your contributions for a portfolio piece? Um, so generally when people do, uh, you know, kind of like uh, a portfolio piece where they've contributed to a uh, to a scene rather than doing the entire thing themselves, they tend to have a, a shot of the actual finished scene and then they'll have another shot where they isolate their uh, their contribution um, to that particular uh, to that particular project. So if you've uh, got, a you know, um, a big scene with a for you know, with a tree in the middle um, and you built the tree uh, and then you didn't do any of the other surrounding assets, then um, you can kind of do a, a silhouette of that of that asset and kind of darken um, the areas around it so that you can kind of really highlight this is the area I worked on and they'll get a much better view of that. And then you can also just render the uh, assets as a standalone as well. So same goes for materials and things like that. Um, so it's important when you're doing it to make sure that you're very clearly identifying your contribution to that asset. Um, it gets a little bit harder if you have jointly collaborated. So you've kind of gone back and forth on, you know, on the model and one of you UV'd it and the other person textured it and then the other person did like the normal for it and stuff like that. And at that point, once it gets really, really muddy, you just need to basically say that you collaborated and try and describe um, the, the elements that you did uh, for that. Um, the main thing is just making sure that you are um, crediting um, the work that's due and making it very clear the work that you did. Um, is don't build custom streaming logic Project Titan advice or just good general life advice? <laughs> that one. Um, so in this case, it is uh, Titan advice because really it's, it's yeah, it's the like tongue cheap question, but it does lead to an important thing, which is when you're working with technology, it is better to work with the tech you're working with than force it into a box it doesn't fit in. So in this case, we're using Unreal's World Partition one file per actor systems to deal with our streaming. Consequently, building a custom streaming solution on top of that is just making your life more complicated. It's better to build environment that fits within the streaming system that you're using. It's like anything, like if you're using Niagara you should, to do VFX, you should be working with Niagara not, Niagara, not trying to force it to do things it doesn't do. And it's that's basically game development 101, is you need mm. to try and work within, within the system that you're within and work out where you can push the boundaries and where you can't. So yeah, like custom streaming in Titan seems like a not good idea, something we shouldn't do. If you're doing a totally different game, sure, why not? I can give yeah. you a specific example of this, um, not just with Word Partition, but with um, a Mover that I actually saw the other day. Um, teleporting. Okay, so usually um, in Unreal, you have a teleport actor to location function, right? But because of the way that Mover and Word Partition uh, works, you actually have to consider two things. The first one with Mover is that you're not actually going to sync all of the state information for movement, which is going to cause a massive slowdown and probably some desyncs at some point. It's going to be worse in multiplayer. So if you want to teleport, you actually have to do it uh, through Mover instead of through the actor. The other one is World Partition, because if you're teleporting to a um, grid cell in the world that is not currently loaded, you're just going to fall down through through the game world, and you're not guaranteed uh, that the streaming system is going to load in time. So usually what you do, if you want to do a um, teleport mechanic that actually works in this context, is you have to signal the world to start loading the um, the other segment of the world, you're going to have to do uh, something to burn some time in the meantime to uh, give the system time to catch up. And then you're going to have to teleport using the, uh, the right function for something like that. So it's it's that kind of things uh, that is, uh, it's, it's part of the reason why we say, well, if you want um, custom mechanics, do reach out and do post a feature request because we probably have a better solution for that that is not going to cause you and us a lot of grief down the line. Yep. 
uh, question, is the global distance field enabled? I believe it is. Uh, can PBR materials be used? Um, so that one's a bit of an interesting one because like Unreal is a physically based rendered, uh, you know, kind of engine. Um, so technically the materials are all physically based. They use an albedo, they use a metal and a roughness mask and an oil. Um, and they calculate light and, and all of that stuff in, in a physically based way. Um, I, what I'm guessing you mean maybe is that it's, it's more towards the realism point, which obviously, no, uh, we're going, um, you know, kind of stylistic on this. And again, check brief, uh, check for the uh, tutorials for um, an idea of the kind of art style we're going for, um, for that element. Uh, do you guys have a template available we can follow for exporting textures from Substance Painter with your requirements? Um, no, we don't, but one has already been posted in the general chat, I think it is. Um, it's, it is very simple to set up, though. The diffuse, you just need to make sure, or the albedo, you just need to make sure uh, is 8-bit before you export it. Um, there's a, a, um, a node in Substance Designer called RGBA Merge, so you just need to channel pack using that um, and then output that result. Um, you can leave that as 16-bit and it's imported in, it'll be 8-bit, but the important thing is, is that it's linear, um, so not gamma corrected uh, for those elements. And then the normal, you just export as well. So um, you only need those three um, for, for that, um, unless you're making a detail normal. Uh, it's suggested to use assets others made already in the project to save on space. Um, not just save on space, but to save on time. Um, and, and it's general good practice to reuse the assets that you have because they're already loaded into memory. Um, so you, you get a lot of benefits from reusing the content that's there. Again, um, this is not a, you know, kind of standalone, I'm just going to build my, my little area. This is a collaborative art jam. Everyone has access to everything. Everyone should share and collaborate as much as possible. And that includes building and designing content that can be reused in other places. So um, the, the brick wall example is a great one. That is a, a great asset to be used in other areas and people should be seeing that. And um, unless there is a, a an either a better version that can be made or um, a significant variant on it that can be used as an alternative, they shouldn't be building something that's just basically the same asset um, because that's just wasteful. We don't need, you know, kind of 30 different, you know, kind of variations on the same uh, on the same texture. Um, it, you should have very clear variation on that. Um, so it makes sense for some areas, you know, the, the stone that has been mined would be different in some regions. So you might have some variation there on the types of stone and and, and how that stone would have been mined and, 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 and made. Um, but uh, where possible, reuse the, the content that's already available. Um, and that's fine. Uh, I think we are nearly at the end. Last three questions and then we will finish up. Uh, question, do ideas or concepts need to be validated or verified or allowed by a bioadmin? I think we've already answered this one. Um, but but um, you should communicate and collaborate with the people in that biome. Um, can you use material zones to use several pre-made materials and things like metal or wood in one mesh? Uh, and by material zones, I think you mean material IDs. And yes, you can, but don't go crazy with your material IDs. Um, you generally don't want more than kind of like three or four material IDs on an asset. Um, basically, you're just adding to your draw call count every time you create uh, a different material. Um, since the samples will be crediting people, do we need to credit people when we're using the assets in the sample? Because I believe we don't need to credit UE samples when we use them. Um, you don't need to do any crediting if you're building inside Titan. Um, the, the credits list will be accumulated as we go, and that will be output as an end result. So um, you don't need to worry about it as long as um, you know we'll see the the commits being put in and, and we'll build up a credit list and then you can opt in and out um, for that. Uh, oh, we've done all of them. That's it. Okay. Oh, right. Um, 
so so that's the end of the stream uh next week we are going to be chatting again with uh Folygon and we'll be doing a bit of a deeper dive into the character creation process and how you can go about creating characters that are uh, in keeping with the world of Titan um we uh will be doing these streams weekly uh we will probably be doing them slightly later uh for the next stream so keep an eye out for the next announcement on when we will be doing that um, so that Sam doesn't need to ingest quite as much coffee uh, to be to be up this early. Um, if you are joining um, or you're interested in joining Titan, uh, you can still sign up on the ArtStation page. Um, though, as again, reminder, they are done weekly, so you will have to wait to be added to the server and the Discord. You'll get an email um, for that for that data. Um, outside of that, uh, Sam, Seb, all the all the people hidden away who are helping out making sure this works. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for tuning in and listening. Uh, and we will see you in the Discord uh, and see you next week. Bye, everybody.